Chapter Eight, Part One of the Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter Eight, Jack of All Trades, Part One. The career of Franklin teaches very strongly that general ability rather than special aptitude is the quality most potent in winning success for it is impossible not to conclude that he possessed elements which would have raised him even if his lot had been other than what it was several times in his life he changed his vocation or interests but never with apparent loss and the main impression that his life leaves on the student is that he was not merely multidextrous but multi-minded franklin came of a working family and my elder brothers he states were all put apprentices to different trades he himself when ten years old was taken from school to quote, assist my father in his business which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler a business he was not bred to but had assumed on his arrival in new england and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family being in little request accordingly i was employed in cutting wick for candles filling the dipping mould and the moulds for cast candles attending the shop going on errands etc the lad did not take kindly to the work and quote, had a strong inclination for the sea but my father declared against it end quote. so benjamin worked on for two years destined he feared to become a tallow chandler quote, but my dislike to the trade continuing my father was under apprehension that if i did not find one more agreeable i should break away and get to sea as his son josiah had done to his great vexation the desire for a sailor's life was short-lived for when at sixteen he ran off he states that my inclinations for the sea were by this time worn out or i might now have gratified them nor did a longing for it ever recur on his first visit to england he found so he chronicles the voyage not a pleasant one as we had a good deal of bad weather and on the return trip he saw cause for congratulation at having happily completed so tedious and dangerous a voyage once convinced that his son would not contentedly accept his own handicraft josiah franklin set to work to find out one more suited to his predilection Quote, he therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners bricklayers turners braziers etc at their work that he might observe my inclination and endeavour to fit it on some trade or other on land my father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade and my uncle benjamin's son samuel who was bred to that business in london being about that time established in boston i was sent to be with him some time on liking but his expectations of a fee with me displeasing my father i was taken home again end quote. eventually as already recorded the boy of twelve was apprenticed to printing yet though he considered it from henceforth his special calling and was ever proud of it he was at moments easily led away to other vocations and as soon as he was able he retired from all active plying of the art and mystery save as an occasional pastime giving his time and attention to other occupations the first inclination to change was during his early london visit he relates that in the printing office he was jocosely called the water american because he preferred that beverage to beer but the title might more appropriately have been given him because of his extreme liking for aquatics i learned early to swim well he declared even delighted with this exercise and as a child practised all thevenot's motions and positions adding some of my own aiming at the graceful and easy as well as at the useful late in life he wrote when i was a boy i made two oval pallets each about ten inches long and six broad with a hole for the thumb in order to retain it fast in the palm of my hand they much resembled a painter's palettes. In swimming, I pushed the edges of these forward, and I struck the water with their flat surfaces as I drew them back. I remember I swam faster by means of these palettes, but they fatigued my wrists. End quote. In another reminiscence, he tells of a second boyish device. 
Quote, I amused myself one day with flying a paper kite, and approaching the bank of a pond which was near a mile broad, I tied the string to a stake, and the kite ascended to a very considerable height above the pond while I was swimming. In a little time, being desirous of amusing myself with my kite, and enjoying at the same time the pleasure of swimming, I returned, and loosing from the stake the string with a little stick which was fastened to it, went again into the water, where I found that, lying on my back and holding the stick in my hands, I was drawn along the surface of the water in a very agreeable manner. Having then engaged another boy to carry my clothes round the pond to a place where I pointed out to him on the other side, I began to cross the pond with my kite, which carried me quite over without the least fatigue and with the greatest pleasure imaginable. I was only obliged occasionally to halt a little in my course and resist its progress when it appeared that, by following too quick, I lowered the kite too much by doing which occasionally I made it rise again. I have never since that time practiced this singular mode of swimming, though I think it not impossible to cross in this manner from Dover to Calais. The packet boat, however, is still preferable. End quote. This skill in the water remained with Franklin all through his life. In 1725, going to Chelsea with some gentlemen by water, quote, in our return, at the request of the company, I stripped and leaped into the river and swam from near Chelsea to Blackfriars, performing on the way many feats of activity, both upon and under the water, that surprised and pleased those to whom they were novelties. As a result, I was, to my surprise, sent for by a great man I knew only by name, a Sir William Windham, and I waited upon him. He had heard by some means or other of my swimming from Chelsea to Blackfriars, and of my teaching Wygate and another young man to swim in a few hours. He had two sons about to set out on their travels. He wished to have them first taught swimming, and proposed to gratify me handsomely if I would teach them. They were not yet come to town, and my stay was uncertain, so I could not undertake it. But from this incident I thought it likely that, if I were to remain in England and open a swimming school, I might get a good deal of money, and it struck me so strongly that, had the overture been sooner made me, probably I should not so soon have returned to America. End quote. A more notable feat than this swim from Chelsea to Blackfriars was performed by Franklin in his voyage back to America a few months later, when, in the open ocean, he leaped overboard and swam around the ship to wash myself. There is small wonder, after this exhibition of skill and confidence, that Franklin felt some irritation over the incident which he described to a correspondent only a few months before his death. Quote, the letter of yours enclosed is from the widow of a Jew, who happened to be one of a number of passengers that were about forty years ago in a stage boat going to New York, and which, by the unskillful management of the boatman, overset the canoe from whence I was endeavoring to get on board her, near Staten Island, has ever since worried me with demands of a gratia for having, as he pretended, been instrumental in saving my life though that was in no danger, as we were near the shore, and you know what an expert swimmer I am, and he was no more of any service to me in stopping the boat to take me in than every other passenger, to all whom I gave a liberal entertainment at the tavern when we arrived in New York, to their general satisfaction at the time. But this Haynes never saw me afterwards, at New York, or Brunswick, or Philadelphia, that he did not dun me for money on the pretense of his being poor, and having been so happy as to be instrumental in saving my life, which was really in no danger. In this way he got of me sometimes a double Jonas, sometimes a Spanish doubloon, and never less, how much in the whole I do not know, having kept no account of it, but it must have been a very considerable sum, and as he has neither incurred any risk, nor was it any trouble in my behalf, I have long since thought him well paid for any little expense of humanity he might have felt on the occasion. He seems, however, to have left me to his widow as part of her dowry." End quote. 
even in the last years of his life franklin illustrated his expertness for at nearly eighty years of age he relates that he went at noon to bathe in martin's saltwater hot bath and floating on my back fell asleep and slept near an hour by my watch without sinking or turning a thing i never did before and should hardly have thought possible end quote his fondness for water led him to claim that the exercise of swimming is one of the most healthy and agreeable in the world after having swam for an hour or two in the evening one sleeps coolly the whole night even during the most ardent heat of summer perhaps the pores being cleansed the insensible perspiration increases and occasions this coolness i speak from my own experience frequently repeated and that of others to whom i have recommended this End quote. From becoming a swimming teacher, Franklin was dissuaded by a Philadelphia merchant, Mr. Denham, who induced him as well to leave Watt's printing office. Quote, he proposed to take me over as his clerk to keep his books in which he would instruct me, copy his letters, and attend the store. He added that as soon as I should be acquainted with mercantile business, he would promote me by sending me with a cargo of flour and bread, etc., to the West Indies, and procure me commissions from others which would be profitable, and if I managed well, would establish me handsomely. The thing pleased me, for I was grown tired of London, remembered with pleasure the happy months I had spent in Pennsylvania, and wished again to see it therefore i immediately agreed on the terms of fifty pounds a year pennsylvania money less indeed than my present gettings as a compositor but affording a better prospect mr denham took a store in water street where we opened our goods i attended the business diligently studied accounts and grew in a little time expert at selling but in the beginning of february seventeen twenty six seven when i had just passed my twenty-first year we were both taken ill i forget what his distemper was it held him a long time and at length carried him off he left me a small legacy in a non coopative will as a token of his kindness for me and he left me once more to the wide world for the store was taken into the care of his executors and my employment under him ended End quote. left in a lurch by this loss of position franklin returned to printing for a livelihood with the success already described but though his chief trade it was not his only one even when he was most actively engaged in it as a natural adjunct he established a bindery and took an interest in a paper mill his newspaper informing the public that quote, ready money for old rags may be had of the printer hereof and at the time i established myself in pennsylvania there was not a bookseller's shop in any of the colonies to the southwards of boston in new york and philadelphia the printers were indeed stationers they sold only paper etc almanacs ballads and a few books those who loved reading were obliged to send for their books from london End quote. this inconvenience franklin ended by opening a store for the sale of european works advertising his importations in the pennsylvania gazette or by the issue of pamphlet catalogues he also established a little stationer's shop where were to be had chapman's books ballads good writing paper choice writing parchment ciphering slates and pencils hallman's ink powders ivory pocket books pounce and pounce boxes sealing wax wafers pencils fountain pens choice english quills brass ink horns sand glasses fine mezzotints a great variety of maps cheap pictures engraved on copper plate of all sorts of birds beasts fishes fruits flowers and useful to such as would learn to draw End quote. these various commodities the shopkeeper kept in stock but he would trade in anything in which he could see a chance to profit despite his aversion to the business how he sold consignments of the franklin crown soap has already been told but that was only one of the many ventures he took and the gazette informed its readers from time to time that quote, the printer hereof had for sale such merchandise as very good sack at six cents per gallon glazed filling papers and bonnet papers very good lamp black very good chocolate 
linseed oil very good coffee compasses and scales seneca rattlesnake root with directions on how to use it in the pleurisy etc dividers and protractors a very good second-hand two-wheeled chaise a very neat new-fashioned vehicle or four-wheeled chaise very convenient to carry weak or other sick persons old or young good rhode island cheese and codfish quadrants four staffs nocturnals mariners compasses seasoned merchantable boards coarse and fine edgings fine broad scarlet cloth fine broad black cloth fine white thread hose and english sail duck very good iron stoves a large horse fit for a chair or a saddle the true and genuine godfrey's cordial choice bohe tea very good english saffron new york lottery tickets choice mackerel to be sold by the barrel a large copper steel very good spermacity fine palm oil very good temple spectacles a new fishing net End quote. a stranger mode of turning a penny was by a venture now and again in indentured and bond servants being such immigrants as sold their service for a stated number of years in return for a passage to the colonies franklin would occasionally purchase the time as the expression then was of some of these and then in the columns of his paper would insert advertisements of which the following are samples Quote, a likely servant lad's time to be disposed of he is fit for country and town business has four years of service and has been in the country a year and a half inquire of the printer to be sold a likely woman servant having three years and a half to serve she is a good spinner to be sold a likely servant lad about fifteen years of age and has six years to serve to be sold a young servant welsh woman having one year and a half to serve and is fit for town or country service inquire of the printer to be sold a likely dutch servant girl about thirteen years of age and has five years to serve a likely young woman's time to be disposed of about eighteen years of age fit for town or country business and can handle her needle well to be sold an irish servant girl's time she has three years and three quarters to serve is young and fit for town or country business End quote. a somewhat kindred but more regrettable traffic was one in slaves though due to the friends there was a very positive public sentiment in philadelphia against slavery and still more against the buying and selling of men franklin had too much new england canonists to regard it and made many a venture in the purchase and sale of negroes his newspaper informing the public that quote, a likely young negro wench who is a good cook and can wash well is to be disposed of inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a likely young negro wench about eighteen years of age speaks good english and is fit for either town or country inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a likely mulatto girl aged about sixteen years has had the smallpox and is fit for either town or country to be disposed of very reasonable inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a likely young negro fellow about twenty-six years of age suitable for any farming or plantation business having been long accustomed to it and has had the smallpox inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a negro man twenty-two years of age of uncommon strength and activity very fit for a farmer or a laborious trade he understands the best methods of managing horses and is very faithful in the employment any person that wants such a one may see him by inquiring of the printer hereof to be sold a likely negro woman with a man-child fit for town or country business inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a lusty young negro woman fit for the country business she has had the smallpox and measles inquire of the printer hereof to be sold a prime able young negro man fit for laborious work in town or country that has had the smallpox as also a middle-aged negro man that has likewise had the smallpox inquire of the printer hereof or otherwise they will be exposed to sale in public venue on saturday the eleventh of april next at twelve o'clock at the indian king in market street 
some of these slaves he procured from new england where as population grew in density the need for them passed leading to their sale in the colonies to the southward and there was not always a profit for franklin of one purchase of husband and wife wrote to his mother quote, we conclude to sell them both the first good opportunity for we do not like negro servants end quote. with the result that quote, we got again about half what we lost end quote in spite of this prejudice franklin took with him two negro servants to england on his second visit with slight benefit for one who quote, was of little use and often in mischief ran off within a year and the other behaved only as well as i could expect in a country where there are many occasions of spoiling servants if they are ever so good he has as few faults as most of them the philosopher observed and i see with only one eye and hear with only one ear so we rub on pretty comfortably end of chapter eight part one chapter eight part two of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter eight jack of all trades part two franklin as he grew in years came to disapprove heartily of the whole slave system and he expressed satisfaction quote, that a disposition to abolish slavery prevails in north america that many pennsylvanians have set their slaves at liberty and that even the virginia assembly have petitioned the king for permission to make a law for preventing the importation of more into the colony End quote when the initial abolition society in america was formed he became its president and his name was signed to the first petition for the abolition of the slave trade ever sent to congress an act which resulted in his being personally vituperated on the floor of that body less than a month before his death the debate on this petition drew from him the last public paper he ever penned in which with his usual socratic cleverness he took all the arguments advanced by the favorers of slavery and by putting them into the mouth of an algerine as reasons for continuing the holding of europeans in bondage made each one become a reason for ending the system as franklin was an instinctive trader so he was a natural artisan Quote, it has ever been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools he remarked in his autobiography and it has been useful to me having learnt to be able to do little jobs myself in my house when a workman could not readily be got and to construct little machines for my experiments while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind End quote how he in his printing office contrived moulds made printer's ink constructed a copper plate press cut ornaments for the paper money and in other ways proved that his abilities were not merely intellectual is told elsewhere his scientific writings continually describe quote, little machines that i had roughly made for myself end quote so too though almost wholly without art instinct he made diagrams and sketches to illustrate and explain his writings that prove a fair knowledge of perspective and a distinct knack of fingers he even essayed at times to do an artist's work long after his retirement from active printing the continental congress secured his aid in the design of their currency and he not only merely sketched the cuts but having in some of his studies discovered that the veins of leaves like the lines of the finger ends were never alike he suggested the use of a different leaf for each denomination thus making counterfeit difficult for his gazette he engraved a crude type metal map of the siege of louisburg which so far as known is the first attempt of a paper to illustrate news so in his pamphlet entitled plain truth he designed and engraved a cut of hercules and the wagoner during stamp act times he made a symbolic print which had considerable vogue while serving in the continental congress he was appointed a member of the committee to prepare devices for a great seal and he suggested moses lifting up his wand and dividing the red sea and pharaoh and his chariot overwhelmed by the waters with the motto rebellion to tyrants is obedience to god which was adopted by the committee but rejected by congress 
in seventeen eighty two of his own volition and at his own charge he had struck after his ideas a medal to commemorate the revolution which he reports was mighty well received and gives general pleasure in paris and which he hopes will be equally liked in america a greater service he rendered to art was in selecting houdon for the execution of the bust of washington voted by virginia and in persuading that sculptor to undertake the commission however little of an artist he may have been a number of his most intimate friends were of that profession and he shows the interest of a cultivated man in their work with benjamin west a friendship was formed in pennsylvania long before the painter was known as such when he went to london franklin gave him letters of introduction that helped him materially and the two corresponded on terms of close intimacy during the rest of franklin's life to patience wright another american and the madame tussard of her day he gave aid and friendship and helped her son when he came to paris as a would-be artist afterward consenting to sit to him for one of the first portraits the artist ever painted in london he made the acquaintance of john flaxman when his career was just beginning and he it was who brought the young fellow to the attention of josiah wedgwood franklin had early in life become interested in the problem of printing on china and this served to give him a common interest with wedgwood and led to a lifelong friendship with the artist potter he even thought himself first in the field in this process writing an engraver who had sent him some specimens in reference to the invention quote, i know not who portends to that of the copperplate engravings for earthenware and i am not disposed to contest the honour with anybody as the improvement in taking impressions not directly from the plate but from printed paper applicable by that means to other than flat forms is far beyond my first idea but i have reason to apprehend that i might have given the hint on which the improvement was made for more than twenty years since i wrote to dr mitchell from america proposing to him the printing of square tiles for ornamenting chimneys from copper plates describing the manner in which i thought it might be done and advising the borrowing from the booksellers the plates that had been used in a thin folio called moral virtue delineated for the purpose the dutch deltware tiles were much used in america which are only or chiefly scripture histories wretchedly scrawled i wished to have those moral prints which were originally taken from horace's poetical figures introduced on tiles which being about our chimneys and constantly in the eyes of children when by the fireside might give parents an opportunity in explaining them to impress moral sentiments and i gave expectations of great demand for them if executed dr mitchell wrote to me in answer that he had communicated my scheme to several of the principal artists in the earthen way about london who rejected it as impracticable and it was not till some years after that i first saw an enamelled snuff-box which i was sure was from a copper plate though the curvature of the form made me wonder how the impression was taken End quote it is a curious fact that franklin however much a mechanic and however fertile-minded left behind him so few inventions of any great value his lightning-rod and his stove elsewhere described being his only important discoveries yet as in his idea of printing on china many of his imperfect ideas could have been developed into very valuable improvements how he experimented in stereotyping has already been told before argand invented his lamp franklin had conceived the idea of a burner which should supply a column of air in the centre he made an essay with a bulrush without success and according to jefferson quote, his occupations did not permit him to repeat and extend his trials to the introduction of a larger column of air than could pass through the stem of a bulrush End quote yet he seems to have achieved a partial success for a visitor to his house noted quote, a lamp which with only three small wicks gives a luster equal to six candles a pipe is introduced into the midst which supplies fresh and cool air to the lights End quote having found an account of quote, a well-known practice of the chinese to divide the hold of a great ship into a number of separate chambers by partitions tight caulked 
he suggested that the system might with advantage be introduced into shipbuilding as a safeguard to life and property but the subject is so briefly dwelt upon as to show that he attached little value to what has since become to be of such consequence so contending that quote, men do not act like reasonable creatures when they build for themselves combustible dwellings in which they are every day obliged to use fire end quote, he drew up a paper on how houses could be better protected from the risk when he himself built he evolved a system tending to the modern fireproof construction by quote, a few precautions not generally used to wit none of the wooden work of one room communicates with the wooden work of any other room and all the floors and even the steps of the stairs are plastered close end quote. of minor improvements franklin perfected more he first made for his own use the double spectacles with lenses curved for near and far sight he constructed a clock with three wheels only which showed hours minutes and seconds though not the first to make letter copying presses he was consulted by watt and suggested several improvements which made them more effective for his own convenience he worked out an artificial arm for taking books from shelves out of reach in his library quote, below the grate on the hearth there was a small iron plate or trap door about five or six inches square with a hinge and a small ring to raise it by when this door or valve was raised a current of air from the cellar rushed up through the grate to rekindle the fire at the head of his bed there were two cords one was a bell pull and the other when pulled raised an iron bolt about an inch square and nine or ten inches long which dropped through staples at the top of the door when shut and until this bolt was raised the door could not be opened End quote in seventeen eighty seven washington as he phrased it in his diary quote, visited a machine at dr franklin's called a mangle for pressing in place of ironing clothes from the wash which machine from the facility with which it dispatches business is well calculated for tablecloths and such articles as have not pleats and irregular foldings and would be very useful in all large families End quote such are samples of his almost numberless devices and improvements an invention not to be passed over was a musical instrument of which franklin thought so highly as to believe that it would entirely supersede the piano and harpsichord in london during his second visit franklin heard a mr delaval a most ingenious member of our royal society play melodies by rubbing his fingers upon the edges of glass bowls which had been first tuned by putting into them water more or less as each note required being charmed by the sweetness of its tones and the music he produced from it franklin set about perfecting the idea into an instrument he had blown a number of glass half spheres of different sizes and these he tuned by grinding away the edges until they were in harmony with the notes of the harpsichord having obtained this result he placed thirty-seven of them quote, sufficient for three octaves with all the semitones upon a spindle which by means of a wheel and pedal could be revolved this instrument is played upon by sitting before the middle of the set of glasses as before the keys of a harpsichord turning them with the foot and wetting them with a sponge and clean water the fingers should be first a little soaked in water and quite free from all greasiness a little fine chalk upon them is sometimes useful to make them catch the glass and bring out the tones more readily both hands are used by which means different parts are played together observe the tones are best drawn out when the glasses turn from the ends of the fingers not when they turn to them franklin named it the armonica in honor so he wrote in italian of your musical language and claimed that the advantages of this instrument are that its tones are incomparably sweet beyond those of any other that they may be swelled and softened at the pleasure by stronger or weaker pressures of the finger and continued to any length and that the instrument being once well tuned never again wants tuning he himself took great pleasure in playing upon it and an amusing glimpse is obtained of him during his last years by a paragraph of one of his letters in which he said 
monsieur pagan did me the honor of visiting me yesterday he is assuredly one of the best men possible for he had the patience to listen to me playing an air on the harmonica and to hear it to the end again madame brelon seeking to tempt him to her home promises that quote, father pagan will play the god of love on the violin i will march on the piano you little birds on the harmonica End quote. and the same writer in describing their future life in heaven prophecies that quote, monsieur mesmer will be contented with playing on the harmonica without boring us with electric fluid End quote. franklin was a performer on more than the harmonica for previous to his development of it he could play on the harp the guitar and the violin referring to a present he told the donor that he should Quote, never touch the sweet strings of the british lyre without remembering my british friends and particularly the kind giver of the instrument End quote. in france a friend wrote him that he had searched for harps everywhere without being able to find any and offers to procure him a pianoforte for it will supply the place of the harp End quote this may not have been for his own use however for franklin assured madame brulon that in the forty years he would probably have in heaven before her advent he should have time enough to practice on the harmonica and perhaps i shall play well enough to be worthy to accompany you on the pianoforte and in this case we shall have every now and then some little concerts he even seems to have turned his hand to composing for the same lady acknowledged the receipt of your music engraved in america but it has not been possible to identify the piece this ends chapter eight part two chapter eight part three of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 8. Jack of All Trades. Part 3. Nothing better shows Franklin's versatility and capacity than the services he rendered in the three great wars of his time. His first introduction to military affairs was due to a condition peculiar to Pennsylvania during the war of the austrian succession although french and spanish privateers sailed boldly into the delaware capturing ships and plundering plantations plead as the governor of that colony would the quakers who controlled the pennsylvania assembly principled against war refused to raise troops or fortify the river nor would the rich and powerful leaders opposed to that sect do more their reasoning according to franklin being quote, shall we lay out our money to protect the trade of quakers shall we fight to defend quakers no let the trade perish and the city burn let what will happen we shall never lift a finger to prevent it End quote. and in genuine indignation he remarked quote, till of late i could scarce believe the story of him who refused to pump in a sinking ship because one on board whom he hated would be saved by it as well as himself End quote. in this condition of affairs franklin turned from his presses and made an appeal to those who like himself were quote, the middling people the farmers shopkeepers and tradesmen of our city and country whose interests were forgotten through the dissension of our leaders through mistaken principles of religion joined with love of worldly power on the one hand through pride envy and implacable resentment on the other i am determined to try what might be done by a voluntary association of the people to promote this i first wrote and published a pamphlet entitled plain truth in which i stated our defenceless situation in strong lights with the necessity of union and discipline for our defense and promised to propose in a few days an association to be generally signed for that purpose the pamphlet had a sudden and surprising effect i was called upon for the instrument of association and copies being dispersed in the country the subscribers amounted at length to upward of ten thousand 
these all furnished themselves as soon as they could with arms formed themselves into companies and regiments chose their own officers and met every week to be instructed in the manual exercise and other parts of military discipline the women by subscriptions among themselves provided silk colors which they presented to the companies painted with different devices and mottoes which i supplied the officers of the companies composing the philadelphia regiment being met chose me for their colonel but conceiving myself unfit i declined that station and recommended mr lawrence a fine person and man of influence who was accordingly appointed i then proposed a lottery to defray the expense of building a battery below the town and furnishing it with cannon it filled expeditiously and the battery was soon erected the associators kept a nightly guard while the war lasted and among the rest i regularly took my turn of duty there as a common soldier End quote. franklin found that Quote, my activity in these operations was agreeable to the governor and council they took me into confidence and i was consulted by them in every measure wherein their concurrence was thought useful to the association End quote calling in the aid of religion quote, i proposed to them the proclaiming of a fast to promote reformation and implore the blessing of heaven on our undertaking End quote having thus appealed to the religious part of the community franklin as well devised a means of influencing the people socially it is proposed he told a correspondent to breed gunners by forming an artillery club to go down weekly to the battery and exercise the great guns the best engineers against cape breton were of such a club tradesmen and shopkeepers of boston i was with them at the castle at their exercise in seventeen forty three End quote. having made himself so useful it was natural that with the outbreak of the french and indian war his services should once more be in demand in behalf of the pennsylvania assembly he was sent to confer with general braddock and finding the british commander in straits for teams and pack horses he undertook the task of obtaining them for him with such success that quote, in two weeks one hundred and fifty wagons with two hundred and fifty nine carrying horses were on their march for the camp End quote to accomplish which franklin advanced out of his own pocket upward of two hundred pounds and furthermore gave his bond for their return or payment according to valuation he also undertook to aid the general in furnishing him with provisions quote, advancing for the service of my own money upwards of one thousand pounds sterling End quote learning that the subaltern officers were having difficulty to obtain a store of provisions for their march through the wilderness he obtained a vote from the assembly which furnished each one of them a gift of such supplies as would be of the most value to them far more valuable than all this however was some unheeded advice he gave braddock which is well worth quotation Quote, in conversation with him one day he was giving me some account of his intended progress after taking fort duquesne says he i am to proceed to niagara and having taken that to frontenac if the season will allow time and i suppose it will fort duquesne can hardly detain me above three or four days and then i see nothing that can obstruct my march to niagara having before revolved in my mind the long line his army must make in their march by a very narrow road to be cut for them through the woods and bushes and also what i had read of the former defeat of fifteen hundred french who invaded the iroquois country i had conceived some doubts and some fears for the event of the campaign but i ventured only to say to be sure sir if you arrive well before duquesne with these fine troops so well provided with artillery that place not completely fortified and as we hear with no very strong garrison can probably make but a short resistance the only danger i apprehend of obstruction to your march is from the ambuscades of indians who by constant practice are dexterous in laying and executing them and the slender line near four miles long which your army must make may expose it to be attacked by surprise in its flanks and to be cut like a thread into several pieces which from their distance cannot come up in time to support each other 
he smiled at my ignorance and replied these savages may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw american militia but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops sir it is impossible they should make any impression franklin was no better paid for his aid to braddock than he was for his advice Quote, as soon as the losses of the wagons and horses was generally known all the owners came upon me for the valuation which i had given bond to pay End quote. claims which gave him infinite trouble but which eventually he cleared himself of a credit due on another account however was never paid the disaster to the british army only served to put further labor on the civilian's shoulders the assembly appointed him one of the commissioners for raising and expending money for the defense of the frontiers and he set about this business with his usual energy he drew up a bill for establishing and disciplining a voluntary militia and in its behalf wrote a dialogue which had a great effect he planned and carried through a lottery for raising a further sum of money and this done quote, the governor prevailed with me to take charge of our northwestern frontier which was infested by the enemy and provide for the defense of the inhabitants by raising troops and building a line of forts i undertook this military business though i did not conceive myself well qualified for it end quote a month on the frontier in the depth of winter served to complete the three forts needed and properly to garrison and provision them and franklin returned to philadelphia to find that he had been chosen colonel of the regiment just completed in that city which he now accepted Quote, the first time i reviewed my regiment they accompanied me to my house and would salute me with some rounds fired before my door which shook down and broke several glasses of my electrical apparatus and my new honor proved not much less brittle for all our commissions were soon after broken by a repeal of the law of england End quote. in the revolutionary war despite his years he took an active part how he was sent as a commissioner to canada has already been mentioned and he was one of the committees sent to camp at cambridge to consult with washington and other persons touching the most effectual method of continuing supporting and regulating the continental army for the defense of philadelphia he projected a chavou de frise for the river delaware which proved of the utmost value and well nigh prevented the british from holding that city in seventeen seventy seven as another element of protection he superintended the construction of row galleys a great scarcity of powder in the early period of the war set him to considering some substitute for firearms he accordingly designed a pike and with a curious lack of his usual good sense sought by arguments to convince himself and others that the bow and arrow was still a serviceable weapon and missile first because a man may shoot as truly with a bow as with a common musket secondly he can discharge four arrows in the time of charging and discharging one bullet thirdly his object is not taken from his view by the smoke of his own side fourthly a flight of arrows seen coming upon them terrifies and disturbs the enemy's attention to their business fifthly an arrow sticking in any part of a man puts him hard to combat till it is extracted sixthly bows and arrows are more easily provided everywhere than muskets and ammunition End quote. energetically as franklin worked in war times he was a constant advocate of peace in my opinion he more than once reiterated there never was a good war or a bad peace what repeated follies are these repeated wars he exclaimed you do not want to conquer and govern one another why then should you be continually employed in injuring and destroying one another you are near neighbors he wrote of great britain and france and each have very respectable qualities learn to be quiet and to respect each other's rights you are all christians one is the most christian king and the other the defender of the faith manifest the propriety of these titles by your future conduct by this says christ shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye love one another End quote. he penned a little parable which reveals still more forcibly the unchristianity of war quote, 
in what light we are viewed by superior beings may be gathered from a piece of late west indian news which possibly has not yet reached you a young angel of distinction being sent down to this world on some business for the first time had an old courtier spirit assigned him as a guide they arrived over the seas of martinico in the middle of the long day of obstinate fights between the fleets of rodney and de grasse when through the clouds of smoke he saw the fire of the guns the decks covered with mangled limbs and bodies dead or dying the ships sinking burning or blown into the air and the quantity of pain misery and destruction the crews yet alive were thus with so much eagerness dealing round to one another he turned angrily to his guide and said you blundering blockhead you are ignorant of your business you undertook to conduct me to the earth and you have brought me into hell no sir says the guide i have made no mistake this is really the earth and these are men devils never treat one another in this cruel manner they have more sense and more of what men vainly call humanity End quote recognizing men to be a sort of beings very badly constructed as they are more easily provoked than reconciled more disposed to do mischief to each other than to make reparation much more easily deceived than undeceived and having more pride and even pleasure in killing than in begetting one another and therefore half in doubt if the species were really worth producing or preserving end quote, he none the less did his best to mitigate the horrors of war he argued in favor of the abolition of privateering claiming that the practice of robbing merchants on the high seas was a remnant of ancient piracy in seventeen eighty three in the framing of the treaty of peace with great britain he advocated that the misery of war should be henceforth limited to the actual belligerents and proposed to accomplish this result by an article to the following effect Quote, if war should hereafter arise between great britain and the united states which god forbid the merchants of either country then residing in the other shall be allowed to remain nine months to collect their debts and settle their affairs and may depart freely carrying off all their effects without molestation or hindrance and all fishermen all cultivators of the earth and all artisans or manufacturers unarmed and inhabiting unfortified towns villages or places who labor for the common subsistence and benefit of mankind and peaceably follow their respective employments shall be allowed to continue the same and shall not be molested by the armed force of the enemy in whose power by the events of the war they may happen to fall but if anything is necessary to be taken from them for the use of such armed force the same shall be paid for at a reasonable price and all merchants or traders with their unarmed vessels employed in commerce exchanging the products of different places and thereby rendering the necessities conveniences and comforts of human life more easy to obtain and more general shall be allowed to pass freely unmolested and neither of the powers parties to this treaty shall grant or issue any commission to any private armed vessels empowering them to take or destroy such trading ships or interrupt such commerce End quote. the proposition ran so far in advance of public opinion that the british envoys refused even to consider it but later it was made part of the treaty the american commissioners negotiated with prussia and in that form received better appreciation in great britain a leading review asserting that it was quote, the best lesson of humanity which a philosophical king frederick the second acting in concert with a philosophical patriot franklin could possibly give to the princes and statesmen of the earth End quote. In yet another way, Franklin was far in advance of his own times, for in maintaining that, quote, all wars are follies, very expensive and very mischievous ones. He asked, when will mankind be convinced of this and agree to settle their differences by arbitration? End quote. Franklin's humanity was not limited to the abstract, and his gifts in charity were frequent but knowing that aid of this sort can injure as well as benefit he adopted a system designed to mitigate the evil as far as possible without lessening the good Quote, 
as to the kindness you mention i wish it could have been of more service to you he told a friend but if it had the only thanks i should desire is that you would always be equally ready to serve any other person that may need your assistance and so let good offices go round for mankind are all of a family End quote this method of considering his assistance alone and not a gift is still better shown in a letter to one who had asked for his help quote, i send you herewith a bill for ten louis d'ors i do not pretend to give such a sum i only lend it to you when you shall return to your country with a good character you cannot fail of getting into some business that will in time enable you to pay all your debts in that case when you meet with another honest man in similar distress you must pay me by lending this sum to him enjoining him to discharge the debt by a like operation when he shall be able and shall meet with such another opportunity i hope it may thus go through many hands before it meets with a knave that will stop its progress this is a trick of mine for doing a deal of good with a little money i am not rich enough to afford much in good works and so i am obliged to be cunning and make the most of a little it is interesting to note how far he prospered in a moneyed sense when he first landed in philadelphia quote, my whole stock of cash consisted in a dutch dollar and about a shilling in copper End quote. Very soon he was a percolator to a friend for a debt of twenty pounds he had been empowered to collect, and a little later he ran in debt still more to establish himself as a printer. But once well started, he quickly paid all these claims and began to lay up money. He was able presently to buy his printing office and then a house to live in. How he had his share in a relative's estate divided among his less well-to-do brothers and sisters has been shown, and he left to them also his share of his father's estate, refusing to claim it. When, in 1784, he retired from printing, it was agreed that his partner was to pay him a thousand pounds currency a year, and he had monies loaned on bond and mortgage in seventeen sixty seven writing to his wife he speaks of his financial condition quote, since my partnership with mr hall is expired a great source of our income is cut off and if i should lose the post office which among the many changes here is far from being unlikely we should be reduced to our rents and interests of money for a subsistence which will by no means afford the chargeable housekeeping we have been used to in short with frugality and prudent care we may subsist decently on what we have and leave it entire to our children in 1772 during a panic in london he lent a friend in whom he had confidence five thousand pounds but was forced to borrow the larger portion from a bank for several years he was hopeful of securing with a number of others a patent for a great tract of land on the ohio river a project which only failed by the breaking out of the revolution and which would have made him a rich man had it been completed he succeeded better in a land grant in nova scotia ultimately worth some three thousand pounds before his departure for france in seventeen seventy six he put all the money he could raise between three and four thousand pounds into the hands of congress which demonstrating his confidence encouraged others to lend their money in support of the cause the state of georgia in recognition of his services voted him three thousand acres of land and he also became the owner by gift or purchase of some lands on the ohio when he died his estate consisted of ten houses in philadelphia and almost as many vacant lots a house in boston a pasture near philadelphia and a large farm near burlington in new jersey twelve shares of stock of the bank of north america and personal bonds exceeding eighteen thousand pounds his whole estate being valued at between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars franklin disapproved of public officials having salaries and in accepting the office of president or governor of pennsylvania he states that quote, it was my intention to devote the appointed salary to some public uses 
accordingly i had already before i made my will given large sums of it to colleges schools and building of churches etc and by that instrument wishing to be useful even after my death if possible to this end i devote two thousand pounds sterling of which i give one thousand thereof to the inhabitants of the town of boston in massachusetts and the other thousand to the inhabitants of the city of philadelphia in trust these sums to be lent at interest to such young married artificers under the age of twenty-five years as have served an apprenticeship in the said town and faithfully fulfilled the duties required in their indentures so as to obtain a good moral character from at least two respectable citizens who are willing to become their sureties to assist them in setting up in business as the funds grew the surplus was to be expended quote, in public works which may be judged of most general utility to the inhabitants such as fortifications bridges aqueducts public buildings baths pavements or whatever may make living in the town more convenient to its people and render it more agreeable to strangers resorting thither for health or a temporary residence end quote franklin conceived of these funds eventually reaching millions but though both cities accepted the gifts between the strictness of the terms imposed and poor financial management the trusts have fulfilled only a small part of their testator's wishes and have proved anew that the philanthropy of the living is better than the philanthropy of the dead this ends chapter eight Chapter 9, Part 1 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 9, The Scientist, Part 1. In 1752, when Franklin's letters on electricity were translated into French and printed at Paris, the preceptor of the royal family, the Abbé Nolet, who had formed and published a theory of electricity, would not at first believe that such a work came from America, and said it must have been fabricated by his enemies at Paris to decry his system nor was it for some time that he could be convinced that there really existed such a man as franklin at philadelphia such a fact serves strikingly to show his position in american philosophy it is difficult to discover what first turned franklin's attention to the questions of science and it seems most likely that it was merely one expression of his appetite for learning as a boy in boston so his autobiography relates his brother's paper was aided by quote, some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces end quote. and from another source it is known that among them was dr william douglas who ranked high in the colonies for his learning but the fact that he and his fellow writers were desperately opposed to inoculation reveals the limits of their intellects and makes it improbable that the so-called hellfire club exerted much of an influence upon the apprentice during franklin's brief sojourn in london in seventeen twenty five through twenty six he made the acquaintance of several men of scientific attainments among others of dr mandeville author of the fable of the bees and dr pemberton the secretary of the royal society an asbestos purse he brought with him from america and which he offered for sale secured him the acquaintance of sir hans sloane who franklin relates came to see me and invite me to his house in bloomsbury square where he showed me all his curiosities Pemberton promised to give me an opportunity some time or other of seeing sir isaac newton of which i was extremely desirous but this never happened End quote thus it is evident that even at twenty franklin had strong predilections for men and questions of science his life after his return to philadelphia goes as well to prove his interest here he quote, formed most of my ingenious acquaintance into a club of mutual improvement end quote, which was called the junto each member of which in turn was required to produce one or more queries on any point of morals politics or natural philosophy to be discussed by the company a few of the questions so propounded and debated are known and among them are to be found such as 
how may the phenomena of vapors be explained what is the reason that the tides rise higher in the bay of funday than in the bay of delaware and why does the flame of a candle tend upwards in a spire End quote. it is not probable that the discussions were of much importance though franklin himself asserted that the club was the best school of philosophy morality and politics that then existed in the province for our queries which were read the week preceding their discussion put us upon reading with attention upon the several subjects that we might speak more to the purpose End quote. The early years of his printing were too busy ones to let him devote much time to such subjects, but his newspaper supplies an occasional evidence that he was not wholly neglecting them. In the Gazette, as early as 1732, he wrote, On Making Rivers Navigable, a little later, On Late Discoveries, and in 1737 he compiled for his columns an article on the causes of earthquakes. Quote, the late earthquakes felt here and probably in all the neighboring provinces having made many people desirous to know what may be the natural cause of such violent concussions End quote. though his trade prevented him from all research himself his real interest at the time is well proved by his drawing up a subscription paper to raise an annual fund to enable that accurate observer john bartram who quote, has had a propensity to botanics from his infancy and to the productions of nature in general to pursue his searches after vegetables and fossils on condition that he will describe and yearly communicate to the subscribers the results End quote. out of this subscription grew a far more important project in 1744, Franklin suggested the formation of a society of those interested in science and drew up a proposal or a plan for such an organization to which he gave the name of the American Philosophical Society, offering himself to serve as secretary. His wish was attained so far as the formation, but for many years little was accomplished, and Franklin complained that the members of our society here are very idle gentlemen who will take no pains. End quote. In connection with it, the printer planned to publish an American philosophical miscellany, monthly or quarterly, but this was never achieved. Long after, the society grew into importance, and with Franklin as its president, came to take rank among the learned bodies of Europe. Prior to the issue of the proposal, Franklin had proved his right to be deemed more than a student of science by his invention of the famous Franklin stove. One of his queries for the Gento was entitled, How May Smoke Chimneys Be Best Cured? Suggesting that very early in his studies, his attention was turned to a kindred problem. It is strange, methinks, Franklin remarked, that though chimneys have been for so long in use, the construction should be so little understood, till lately, that no workman pretended to make one which should always carry off all smoke. End quote. Nor was this the only difficulty of the old fireplace the investigator catalogued. It might have the quote, conveniency of two warm seats, one in each corner, but they are sometimes too hot to abide in and the cold air so nips the backs and heels of those that sit before the fire that they have no comfort till either screens or settles are provided. While a moderate quantity of wood on the fire in so large a hearth seems but little, and in so strong and cold a draught warms but little, so that people are continually laying on more. In short, it is next to impossible to warm a room with such a fireplace, as an alternative, a Dutch or German stove could be used, but these had offsetting defects in that they supplied little or no fresh air to the room, and there is no sight of the fire, which in itself is a pleasant thing. End quote. To combine the advantages and eliminate the defects of the two systems was the task he set himself, and in 1742 he evolved the Pennsylvania fireplace, in which the heat from an open fire, after ascending, was made to descend before escaping through the chimney, and thus was made to heat currents of fresh air as they entered the room. It is impossible today to realize what this improvement meant. I suppose our ancestors never thought, said Franklin, of warming rooms to sit in. All they purposed was to have a place to make a fire in by which they might warm themselves when cold. 
but with this stove your whole room is equally warm so that people need not crowd so close round the fire but may sit near the window and have the benefit of the light for reading writing needlework etc and they may sit with comfort in any part of the room which is a very considerable advantage in a large family End quote. it was accomplished too with a great saving in fuel i suppose the inventor claimed taking a number of families together that two-thirds or half the wood at least is saved End quote. he himself found that quote, my common room i know is made twice as warm as it used to be with a quarter of the wood i formerly consumed there End quote. this saving by his own choice was all the profit that accrued to him in his autobiography he said i made a present of the model to mr robert grace one of my early friends who having an iron furnace found the casting of the plates for these stoves a profitable thing as they were growing in demand to promote that demand i wrote and published a pamphlet entitled an account of the new invented pennsylvania fireplaces wherein their construction and manner of operation is particularly explained their advantages above every other method of warming rooms demonstrated and all objections that have been raised against the use of them answered and obviated etc this pamphlet had a good effect governor thomas was so pleased with the construction of this stove as described in it that he offered to give me a patent for the sole vending of them for a term of years but i declined it from a principle which has ever weighed with me on such occasions viz that as we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others in any invention of ours and this we should do freely and generously an ironmonger in london however assuming a good deal of my pamphlet and working it up into his own and making some small changes in the machine which rather hurt its operation got a patent for it there and made as i was told a little fortune by it and this is not the only instance of patents taken out for my inventions by others though not always with the same success which i never contested as having no desire of profiting by patents myself and hating disputes the use of these fireplaces in very many houses both of this and the neighboring colonies has been and is a great saving of wood to the inhabitants many years later franklin invented a second stove which he believed would be of equal service constructed on the principle of the siphon so that the fire was made to draw downward thus consuming its own smoke and which could burn either wood or coal his first model in which the coals were held in an ornamental urn was completed in seventeen seventy one and was used by him successfully for several years but the stove never obtained any general vogue it however supplied the basis of a clever epigram said to have been written by a miss norris which obtained great currency at the time Quote, like newton sublimely he soared to a summit before unattained new regions of science explored and the palm of philosophy gained oh had he been wise to pursue the track for his talent designed what tribute of praise had been due to the teacher and friend of mankind but to covet political fame was in him a degrading ambition a spark that from lucifer came and kindled the flame of sedition let candor then write on his urn here lies the renowned inventor whose flame to the skies sought to burn but inverted descends to the centre although it was not announced until some years later franklin in seventeen forty three made a discovery which if not as utilitarian as his stove bespoke a higher order for scientific research in that year he was prevented from observing an eclipse by a storm which obscured the moon much to his surprise he found that though the storm blew from the northeast yet it had not reached boston till an hour after the eclipse was over this set him to studying the movements of the winds and to the proving of the apparent contradiction that storms travel in an opposite direction from that of the wind impossible as this might seem to reconcile franklin formed a conjecture which is scarcely to be equalled in scientific writing for its clearness convincingness and happy use of comparison Quote, suppose he assumed a great tract of country land and sea to wit 
florida and the bay of mexico to have clear weather for several days and to be heated by the sun and its air thereby exceedingly rarefied suppose the country northeastward as pennsylvania new england nova scotia and newfoundland to be at the same time covered with clouds and its air chilled and condensed the rarefied air being lighter must rise and the denser air next to it will press into its place and that will be followed by the next denser air that by the next and so on thus when i have a fire in my chimney there is a current of air constantly flowing from the door to the chimney but the beginning of the motion was at the chimney where the air being rarefied by the fire rising its place was supplied by the cooler air that was next to it and the place of that by the next and so on to the door so the water in the long sluice or mill-race being stopped by a gate is at rest like the air in a calm but as soon as you open the gate at one end to let it out the water next to the gate begins first to move that which is next to it follows and so though the water proceeds forward to the gate the motion which began there runs backwards if one may so speak to the upper end of the race where the water is last in motion End quote it was in seventeen forty six that franklin's attention was first drawn to electricity from a long period of neglect the subject had suddenly secured renewed attention by gray's experiments as to the conductivity of various substances and dufay's discovery of what he deemed two kinds of electricity close upon these developments came the perfecting of the leyden jar and with it the science sprang into instant popularity traveling electricians went about all over europe exhibiting the phenomena and selling shocks to a half frightened and deeply interested public it was one of these itinerants who set the master printer to studying the mysterious fluid Quote, being at boston i met there with a dr spence who was lately arrived from scotland and showed me some electric experiments they were imperfectly performed as he was not very expert but being on a subject quite new to me they equally surprised and pleased me soon after my return to philadelphia our library company received from mr p collinson fellow of the royal society of london a present of a glass tube with some account of the use of it in making such experiments i eagerly seized the opportunity of repeating what i had seen in boston and by much practice acquired great readiness in performing those also which we had an account of from england adding a number of new ones i say much practice for my house was continually full for some time with people who came to see these new wonders End quote there was a quality in franklin's mind which made it impossible for him not to attempt improvement in whatever he took in hand and within a year he had ascertained a fact which went far to revolutionize the whole science discarding the idea that electricity was a substance created by friction he maintained that it was quote, really an element diffused among and attracted by other matter particularly by water and metals end quote he proved that the leyden jar no matter how highly electrified contained no more electricity than it did before it was charged what was added to one surface being taken from the other this demonstrated he brushed aside dufay's theory of vitreous and resinous electricity and gave to the world in its stead that of a positive and negative or as he sometimes phrased it of a plus and minus state not merely did this account for and explain the great mass of known phenomena but the beginning of modern electricity may be said to date from the discovery for by it the mysterious fluid from being merely a curiosity became potentially a new force or power other investigators had suggested the probable identity of electricity and lightning and to prove this was franklin's next undertaking he first drew up a paper bringing together all the evidence and arguments in favor of the belief but in his scientific work he was never satisfied with a mere theory and so he undertook to demonstrate it probably his method was suggested to him by an account he received of a certain ship's experience with st elmo's fire and a stroke of lightning during a storm 
these masthead globes of fire franklin argued were but quote, the electrical fire then drawing off as by points from the cloud and had there been a good wire communication from the spindle heads to the sea that could have conducted more freely than tarred ropes or masts of turpentine would i imagine there would have either been no stroke or if a stroke the wire would have conducted it all into the sea without damage to the ship to determine the question whether the clouds that contain lightning are electrified or not i would propose an experiment to be tried where it may be done conveniently on the top of some high tower or steeple place a kind of sentry box big enough to contain a man and an electrical stand from the middle of the stand let an iron rod rise and pass bending out of the door and then upright twenty or thirty feet pointed very sharp at the end if the electrical stand be kept clean and dry a man standing on it when such clouds are passing low might be electrified and afford sparks the rod drawing fire to him from a cloud if any danger to the man should be apprehended though i think there would be none let him stand on the floor of his box and now and then bring near to the rod a loop of a wire that has one end fastened to the leads he holding it by a wax handle so that sparks if the rod is electrified will strike from the rod to the wire and not affect him End quote franklin himself was not able to carry out this experiment because philadelphia was without a suitable eminence his suggestion was seized upon however by the french savants buffon d'alibar and delore on a hill at marley a rod was erected and on may tenth seventeen fifty two Quote, a thundercloud having passed over the place where the bar stood those who were appointed to observe it drew near and attracted from it sparks of fire perceiving the same kind of commotions as in the common electrical experiments ere franklin learned of this successful proving of his theory with his method by the french scientists he could write them that quote, the same experiment has succeeded in philadelphia though made in a different and more easy manner End quote. then in a purely abstract form he described the mode which so seized the popular fancy quote, make a small cross of two light strips of cedar the arm so long as to reach to the four corners of a large thin silk handkerchief when extended tie the corners of the handkerchief to the extremities of the cross so you have the body of a kite which being properly accommodated with a tail loop and string will rise in the air like those made of paper but this being of silk is fitter to bear the wet and wind of a thunder gust without tearing to the top of the upright stick of the cross is to be fixed a very sharp pointed wire rising a foot or more above the wood to the end of the twine next to the hand is to be tied a silk ribbon and where the silk and twine join a key may be fastened this kite is to be raised when the thunder gust appears to be coming on and the person who holds the string must stand within a door or a window or under some cover so that the silk ribbon may not be wet and care must be taken that the twine does not touch the frame of the door or window as soon as any of the thunderclouds come over the kite the pointed wire will draw the electric fire from them and the kite with all the twine will be electrified and the loose filaments of the twine will stand out every way and be attracted by an approaching finger and when the rain has wetted the kite and twine so that it can conduct the electric fire freely you will find it stream out plentifully from the key on the approach of your knuckle at this key the file may be charged and from electric fire thus obtained spirits may be kindled and all the other electric experiments be performed which are usually done by the help of a rubbed glass globe or a tube and thereby the sameness of the electric matter with that of lightning completely demonstrated End quote. even before the identity of electricity and lightning had thus been established franklin outlined his proposal for the protection of buildings 
if these things are so he argued as early as seventeen forty nine may not the knowledge of this power of points be of use to mankind in preserving houses churches ships etc from the stroke of lightning by directing us to fix on the highest parts of those edifices upright rods of iron made sharp as a needle and gilt to prevent rusting and from the foot of those rods a wire down the outside of the building into the ground or down round one of the shrouds of a ship and down her side till it reaches the water would not these pointed rods probably draw the electrical fire silently out of a cloud before it came nigh enough to strike and thereby secure us from that most sudden terrible mischief End quote. It was preeminently Franklinian that he should turn his discovery to a useful purpose before the truth of it was accepted, far less confirmed. And few inventors have been so directly rewarded, for he relates that, quote, My own house was one day attacked by lightning, which occasioned the neighbors to run in and give assistance in case of its being on fire. But no damage was done, and my family was only found a good deal frightened with the violence of the explosion. Last year, my house being enlarged, the conductor was obliged to be taken down. I found upon examination that the pointed termination of the copper, which was originally nine inches long and about one-third of an inch in diameter in its thickest part, had been almost entirely melted and that its connection with the rod of iron below was very slight. Thus, in the course of time, this invention has proved of use to the author of it, and has added this personal advantage to the pleasure he before received from having been useful to others. End, quote. End of chapter 9, part 1《ハプナイン》Part Two of the Many-Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter Nine: The Scientist, Part Two. These two most important discoveries of Franklin, as well as his minor experiments, were first made known to Europe by letters he wrote to Mister Collinson. I thought it right. Franklin said in his autobiography, he should be informed of our success in using it, a glass tube, and wrote him several letters containing accounts of our experiments. He got them read in the Royal Society, where they were not at first thought worth so much notice as to be printed in their transactions. One paper which I wrote for Mr. Kinnersley on the sameness of lightning with electricity, I sent to Dr. Mitchell, an acquaintance of mine, and one of the members also of that society, who wrote me word that it had been read, but was laughed at by the connoisseurs. The papers, however, being shown to Dr. Fothergill, he thought them of too much value to be stifled, and advised the printing of them. Mr. Collinson then gave them to Cavey for publication in his Gentleman's Magazine, but he chose to print them separately in a pamphlet, and Dr. Fothersgill wrote the preface. Cavey, it seemed, judged rightly for his profit, for by the editions that arrived afterward, they swelled to a quarto in volume, which has had five editions and cost him nothing for copy money. What gave my book the more sudden and general celebrity was the success of one of its proposed experiments made by Messrs. Dalibard and Lohr at Marley for drawing lightning from the clouds. This engaged the public attention everywhere. M. de Lohr, who had an apparatus for experimental philosophy and lectured in that branch of science, undertook to repeat what he called the Philadelphia experiments, and after they were performed before the king and court, all the curious of Paris flocked to see them. I will not swell this narrative with an account of that capital experiment, nor of the infinite pleasure I received in the success of a similar one I made soon after with a kite at Philadelphia, as both are to be found in the histories of electricity. Dr. Wright, an English physician, when at Paris, wrote to a friend who was of the Royal Society an account of the high esteem my experiments were in among the learned abroad, and of their wonder that my writings had been so little noticed in England. 
the society on this resumed the consideration of the letters that had been read to them and the celebrated dr watson drew up a summary account of them and of all i had afterwards sent to england on the subject which he accompanied with some praise of the writer this summary was then printed in their transactions and some members of the society in london particularly the very ingenious mr canton having verified the experiment of procuring lightning from the clouds by a pointed rod and acquainting them with the success they soon made me more than amends for the slight with which they had before treated me without my having made any application for that honour they chose me a member and voted that i should be excused the customary payments which would have amounted to twenty-five guineas and ever since have given me their transactions gratis they also presented me with the gold medal of sir godfrey copley for the year seventeen fifty three the delivery of which was accompanied by a very handsome speech of the president lord macclesfield wherein i was highly honoured although the use of the lightning rod or as it was then more often called franklin's rod spread rapidly there was a strong opposition at first to its employment john adams reports one wise acre who as late as seventeen fifty eight quote, began to prate upon the presumption of philosophy in erecting iron rods to draw the lightning from the clouds his brains were in a ferment and he railed and foamed against those points and the presumption that erected them in language taken partly from scripture and partly from the disputes of tavern philosophy in as wild mad a manner as king lear raves against his daughter's disobedience and ingratitude and against the meanness of the storm in joining with his daughters against him in shakespeare's lear he talked of presuming upon god as peter attempted to walk upon the water attempting to control the artillery of heaven an execution that mortal man can't stay more publicly the rev thomas prince ignoring the fact that earthquakes had occurred before the erection of these safeguards found in them the cause for the shock of seventeen fifty five and in a sermon urged that quote, the more points of iron are erected round the earth to draw the electrical substance out of the air the more the earth must needs be charged with it and therefore it seems worthy of consideration whether any part of the earth being fuller of this terrible substance may not be more exposed to more shocking earthquakes in boston are more erected than anywhere else in new england and boston seems to be the more dreadfully shaken oh there is no getting out of the mighty hand of god if we think to avoid it in the air we cannot in the earth yea it may grow more fatal so late as seventeen seventy it was maintained that as lightning is one of the means of punishing the sins of mankind and of warning them from the commission of sin it is impious to prevent its full execution there was a yet stranger controversy over this discovery long after the general principle had gained well nigh universal acceptance a powder magazine in europe having been exploded by lightning the british board of ordnance requested the royal society to recommend the best method for preserving the arsenals at purfleet from such a danger the society appointed a committee of five of which franklin was one to prepare a report and they recommended franklin's system but from this one member benjamin wilson dissented so far as to advocate the use of blunt and not pointed ends to the rods the latter were adopted and wilson grown angry published two pamphlets so franklin states Quote, reflecting on the royal society the committee and myself with some asperity End quote. to this franklin made no reply for he explained i have never entered into any controversy in defence of my philosophical opinions i leave them to take their chance in the world if they are right truth and experience will support them if wrong they ought to be refuted and rejected disputes are apt to sour one's temper and disturb one's quiet i have no private interest in the reception of my inventions by the world having never made nor proposed to make the least profit by any of them his friend in genhouse however took up the controversy and was so franklin laughingly noted quote, as much heated about this one point as the jansenists and molinists are about the five 
end quote. There the matter would no doubt have ended had not a new antagonist entered the field. George the Third, having good cause to dislike Franklin's political opinions, sought to discredit his scientific ones by ordering the substitution of blunt for pointed ends on Q Palace. Such was his desire to prove Franklin in error that he asked Sir John Pringle to give an opinion in favor of the change, only to receive a reply that quote, the laws of nature were not changeable at royal pleasure. End quote it was then intimated to him by the king's authority that a president of the royal society entertaining such an opinion ought to resign and he resigned accordingly at the same time being deprived of his position as physician to the queen with all favor in court circles so that he was forced to leave london and live in extreme poverty franklin unwitting of the injury it had brought his friend asserted that the king's action was quote, a matter of small importance to me adding if i had a wish about it it would be that he had rejected them altogether as ineffectual for it is only since he thought himself and family safe from the thunder of heaven that he dared to use his own thunder in destroying his innocent subjects End quote. however the court might side with the king the wits did otherwise and one of them produced an epigram well worth quotation while you great george for safety hunt and sharp conductors change for blunt the nation's out of joint franklin a wiser course pursues and all your thunder fearless views by keeping to the point End quote it is interesting to compare this action of royalty with one of the earliest experiments or tricks in electricity which franklin attempted and which he described to collinson in the following words quote, the magical picture is made thus having a large mezzotinto with a frame and glass suppose of the king god preserve him take out the print and cut a panel out of it near two inches distant from the frame all round if the cut is through the picture it is not the worse with thin paste or gum water fix the border that is cut off on the inside of the glass pressing it smooth and close then fill up the vacancy by gilding the glass well with leaf gold or brass gild likewise the inner edge of the back of the frame all around except the top part and form a communication between that gilding and the gilding behind the glass then put in the board and that side is finished turn up the glass and gild the foreside exactly over the back gilding and when it is dry cover it by pasting on the panel of the picture that hath been cut out observing to bring the correspondent parts of the border and picture together by which the picture will appear of a piece as at first only part is behind the glass and part before hold the picture horizontally by the top and place a little movable gilt crown on the king's head if now the picture be moderately electrified and another person take hold of the frame with one hand so that his fingers touch its inside gilding and with the other hand endeavor to take off the crown he will receive a terrible blow and fail in the attempt if the picture were highly charged the consequence might perhaps be as fatal as that of high treason for when the spark is taken through a choir of paper laid on the picture by means of a wire communication it makes a fair hole through every sheet that is through forty-eight leaves though a choir of paper is thought good armor against the push of a sword or even against a pistol bullet and the crack is exceedingly loud the operator who holds the picture by the upper end where the inside of the frame is not gilt to prevent its falling feels nothing of the shock and may touch the face of the picture without danger which he pretends is a test of his loyalty if a ring of persons take the shock among them the experiment is called the conspirators End quote it was in seventeen fifty seven that franklin's notice was attracted to the effect of oil on the stilling of waves what served to excite his interest he states was observing in a convoy quote, the wakes of two of the ships to be remarkably smooth while all the others were ruffled by the wind which blew fresh being puzzled with the differing appearance i at last pointed it out to our captain and asked him the meaning of it 
the cooks said he have i suppose been just emptying their greasy water through the scuppers which has greased the sides of those ships a little and this answer he gave me with an air of some little contempt as to a person ignorant of what everybody else knew in my own mind i at first slighted his solution though i was not able to think of another End quote. however unsatisfactory the explanation appeared to the inquirer he was too instinctively the scientist and was too well aware that the learned are apt to slight too much the knowledge of the vulgar not to bear it in memory and quote, at length being at chapham where there is on the common a large pond which i observed one day to be very rough with the wind i fetched out a cruet of oil and dropped a little of it on the water i saw it spread itself with surprising swiftness upon the surface but the effect of smoothing the waves was not produced for i had applied it first on the leeward side of the pond where the waves were greatest and the wind drove my oil back upon the shore i then went to the windward side where they began to form and there the oil though not more than a teaspoonful produced an instant calm over a space several yards square which spread amazingly and extended itself gradually till it reached the lee side making all that quarter of the pond perhaps half an acre as smooth as a looking-glass after this i contrived to take with me whenever i went into the country a little oil in the upper hollow joint of my bamboo cane with which i might repeat the experiment as opportunity should offer and i found it constantly to succeed End quote. his experiments and especially one he made at portsmouth during a gale in the presence of some naval officers and members of the royal society led to much discussion and served to spread the knowledge generally it is a typical instance of the qualities of his mind that a casual incident and question were sufficient to set him investigating and thus to bring to the attention of the learned a really important truth long known to more practical men a very similar though not so successful an attempt to spread the knowledge that had been learned not reasoned was in his observations upon the mapping of the gulf stream as early as seventeen forty five he was puzzling why ships should have much shorter voyages from america to england than in returning and wishing he had mathematics enough to satisfy myself that it was not in some degree owing to the diurnal motion of the earth Quote, about the year seventeen sixty nine or seventeen seventy there was an application made by the board of customs at boston to the lords of the treasury in london complaining that the packets between falmouth and new york were generally a fortnight longer in their passages than merchant ships from london to rhode island and proposing that for the future they should be ordered to rhode island instead of new york being then concerned in the management of the american post office i happened to be consulted on the occasion and it appearing strange to me that there should be such a difference between the two places scarce a day's run asunder especially when the merchant ships are generally deeper laden and more weakly manned than the packets and had from london the whole length of the river and channel to run before they left the land of england while the packets had only to go from falmouth i could not but think the fact misunderstood or misrepresented there happened then to be in london a nantucket sea captain of my acquaintance to whom i communicated the affair he told me he believed the fact might be true but the difference was owing to this that the rhode island captains were acquainted with the gulf stream which those of the english packets were not we are well acquainted with that stream says he because in our pursuits of whales which keep near the sides of it but are not to be met with in it we run down along the sides and frequently cross it to change our side and in crossing it have sometimes met and spoke with those packets who were in the middle of it and stemming it we have informed them that they were stemming a current that was against them to the value of three miles an hour and advised them to cross it and get out of it but they were too wise to be counseled by simple american fishermen when the winds are but light he added they are carried back by the current more than they are forwarded by the wind and if the wind be good the subtraction of seventy miles a day from their course is of some importance 
i then observed it was a pity no notice was taken of this current upon the charts and requested him to mark it out for me which he readily complied with adding directions for avoiding it in sailing from europe to north america i procured it to be engraved by order from the general post office on the old chart of the atlantic at mount and pages tower hill and copies were sent down to falmouth for the captains of the packets who slighted it however with each crossing of the ocean that franklin made after learning of this current he kept a careful record of the temperature of the water and from the resulting data concluded that quote, a stranger may know when he is in the gulf stream by the warmth of the water which is much greater than that of the water on each side of it End quote not content with this he ingeniously contrived as well to discover how deep the current extended one service he rendered the scientific world less directly was something he did in seventeen seventy nine at the request of his friend sir joseph banks then president of the royal society the exploring expedition under captain james cook whom franklin had known personally in london was then at sea but owing to the condition of war between the united states and great britain was liable to capture to prevent this franklin then in france issued a printed notice to all captains and commanders of armed ships acting by commission from the congress which recommended most earnestly that quote, in the case the said ship which is now expected to be soon in the european seas on her return should happen to fall into your hands you would not consider her as an enemy nor suffer any plunder to be made of the effects contained in her nor obstruct her immediate return to england the undertaking being truly laudable in itself as the increase of geographical knowledge facilitates the communication between distant nations in the exchange of useful products and manufactures and the extension of arts whereby the common enjoyments of human life are multiplied and augmented the science of other kinds increased to the benefit of mankind in general End quote when the account of cook's voyage was printed at the expense of the english government the board of admiralty sent a copy of it to franklin with a letter from lord howe signifying that it was presented by direction of the king in recognition of franklin's action and one of the gold medals struck by the royal society in honor of cook was likewise given him such are his most important contributions to science which represent however only a small part of the investigations he conducted he first suggested that the aurora was an electrical phenomenon by means of little squares of different colored cloths laid on the snow in a bright sunshiny morning he demonstrated the different effect of color as to heat he studied and wrote upon sun spots shooting stars light heat fire air evaporation the tides rainfall geology the wind whirlwinds water spouts ventilation sound and a universal fluid or ether he followed closely such mechanical developments as the balloon and the steamboat and even such minor ones as improvements in the methods of manufacturing air pumps guns wheels clocks etc there can be no doubt that franklin's greatest pleasure consisted in scientific research when he retired from active printing he said Quote, i flattered myself that i had secured leisure during the rest of my life for philosophical studies and amusements End quote. when later political employment seized hold of him he wrote sighingly to priestley you judge rightly in supposing that i have not much time at present to consider philosophical matters End quote. and a little later he complained to beccaria i find myself here immersed in affairs which absorb my attention and prevent my pursuing those studies in which i always found the highest satisfaction and i am now grown so old as hardly to hope for a return of that leisure and tranquillity so necessary for philosophical disquisitions End quote. during the revolution he assured the president of the royal society Quote, that i long earnestly for a return to those peaceful times when i could sit down in sweet society with my english philosophical friends communicating to each other new discoveries and proposing improvements of old ones all tending to extend the power of man over matter avert or diminish the evils he is subject to or augment the number of his enjoyments 
much more happy should i be thus employed in your most desirable company than in that of all the grandees of the earth projecting plans of mischief however necessary they may be supposed for obtaining greater good End quote. besides carrying on his own studies franklin was never wanting in any assistance he could give to other inquirers and first or last he was in correspondence with almost every scientist of note on two continents in america even before he had made his name known by his discoveries he eagerly sought the friendship of the few men of scientific attainment such as john winthrop james bodwin jared elliot codwallader calden james logan and john bartram his lifelong friendships with sir william watson sir john pringle peter collinson and sir joseph banks have been referred to and he was equally intimate with sir william herschel and many other of his fellow members of the royal society which even the alienations of the revolutionary war did not interrupt and it is interesting to find erasmus darwin saying in a letter to him quote, whilst i am writing to the philosopher and a friend i can scarcely forget that i am also writing to the greatest statesman of the present or perhaps any century who spread the happy contagion of liberty among his countrymen and like the greatest man of all antiquity the leader of the jews delivered them from the house of bondage and the scourge of oppression his chief circle of friends in france were scientists guillotin lavoisier condorcet daubenton d'alembert leroy d'alibard and buffon but perhaps the pleasantest of all his scientific friendships to study are those he gave to far younger men and his advice and encouragement to david rittenhouse in philadelphia and joseph priestley in england bore fruit almost as important as his own labors you know the just esteem jefferson wrote which attached itself to dr franklin's science because he always endeavored to direct it to something useful in private life the chemists have not been attentive enough to this End quote. franklin himself asked what signifies philosophy that does not apply to some use End of chapter nine the scientist chapter ten part one of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter ten the humorist part one nothing more impresses the student of american history in tracing the psychological development of the people than the absence of humor in the first hundred and fifty years following the settlement of the country the english literature on which the colonists had been bred showed no lack of the comic muse and indeed unquestionably proves a greater appreciation of wit and humor than its present-day successor in america however either because the immigrants had been recruited from the unfortunate and the religiously austere or because the hardness of the conditions resulted in a sadness which tinctured the lives of the people there seems to have been a practical extinction of all sense of the humorous notable as franklin is for many things perhaps his most remarkable attribute is that the future historian of the now famous american humor must begin its history with the first publication of poor richard this does not mean that the great american's sense of wit and fun began with the publication of his almanac in the letters of mrs duguid written when he was sixteen years old he shows already a humorous turn of mind and any one who has delved in the extraordinary mortuary lubrications which were once as popular in new england as a modern novel is to-day will appreciate the wittiness of the following extract from one of her letters Quote, a receipt to make a new england funeral elegy for the title of your elegy of these you may have enough ready-made to your hands but if you should choose to make it yourself you must be sure not to omit the words etatis sui which will beautify it exceedingly for the subject of your elegy take one of your neighbors who has lately departed this life it is no great matter at what age the party died but it will be best if he went away suddenly being killed drowned or froze to death having chosen the persons 
take all his virtues excellencies etc and if he have not enough you may borrow some to make up a sufficient quantity to these add his last words dying expressions etc if they are to be had mix all these together and be sure you strain them well then season all with a handful or two of melancholy expressions such as dreadful deadly cruel cold death unhappy fate weeping eyes etc having mixed all these ingredients well put them into the empty skull of some young harvard but in case you have ne'er a one at hand you may use your own there let them ferment for the space of a fortnight and by that time they will be incorporated into a body which take out and having prepared a sufficient quantity of double rhymes such as power flower quiver shiver grieve us leave us tell you excel you expeditions physicians fatigue him intrigue him etc you must spread all upon paper and if you can procure a scrap of latin to put at the end it will garnish it mightily then having affixed your name at the bottom with a maestis composuit you will have an excellent elegy n b this receipt will serve when a female is the subject of your elegy provided you borrow a greater quantity of virtues excellencies etc end quote nor is this the only indication that even as a lad he possessed a keen appreciation of humor when nearly eighty something he relates quote, put me in mind of a violent high church factor resident in boston when i was a boy he had bought upon speculation a connecticut cargo of onions which he flattered himself he might sell again to great profit but the price fell and they lay upon hand he was heartily vexed with his bargain especially when he observed they began to grow in the store he had filled with them he showed them one day to a friend here they are said he and they are growing too i damn them every day but i think they are like the presbyterians the more i curse them the more they grow End quote. in london he relates that he was popular with his fellow journeymen printers because of quote, my being esteemed a pretty good ragette that is a jocular verbal satirist end quote his natural tendency to humor is shown very clearly by the columns of the pennsylvania gazette from the time that franklin assumed its publication i am about courting a girl i have had but little acquaintance with he makes a correspondent write how shall i come to a knowledge of her faults and whether she has the virtues i imagine she has commend her among her female acquaintance advises franklin elsewhere as if to put his joke in concrete form he wrote daphius says cleo has a charming eye what pity tis her shoulder is awry aspasia's shape indeed but then her air twould task a conjurer to find beauty there without a but hortensia she commends the first of women and the best of friends owns her in person wit fame virtue bright but how comes this to pass she died last night he makes another correspondent beg him to let the prettiest creature in this place know by publishing this that if it was not for her affectation she would be absolutely irresistible and in the next issue he prints six denials of the charge from as many different women in the same vein he writes the paper a letter from alice addertung who describes herself as a young girl of about thirty-five who has no care upon my head of getting a living and therefore find it in my duty as well as inclination to exercise my talent at censure for the good of my country folks shall i discover my secret if i have never heard ill of some person i always impute it to defective intelligence for there are none without their faults no not one if she be a woman i take the first opportunity to let all her acquaintance know that i have heard that one of the handsomest or best men in town has said something in praise either of her beauty her wit her virtue or her good management if you know anything of human nature you perceive that this naturally introduces a conversation turning upon all her failings past present and to come 
to the same purpose and with the same success i cause every man of reputation to be praised before his competitors in love business or esteem on account of any particular qualification near the times of election if i find it necessary i commend every candidate before some of the opposite party listening attentively to what is said of him in answer but commendations in this latter case are not always necessary and should be used judiciously of late years i need only observe what they said of one another freely and having for the help of memory taken account of all informations and accusations received whoever peruses my writings after my death may happen to think that during a certain time the people of pennsylvania chose into all their offices of honor and trust the various knaves fools and rascals in the whole province End quote it must not be inferred that all his fooling was at the expense of the gentler sex a drinker's dictionary held up a masculine weakness to scorn he guyed a pair of would-be duelists mercilessly and in a little poem ridiculed a second mannish extravagance quote, the following lines are dedicated to the service of our fair readers which perhaps may give them an useful hint how to behave upon the like occasion the fright myrtle unsheathed his shining blade and fixed its point against his breast then gazed upon the wondering maid and thus his dire resolve expressed since cruel fair with cold disdain you still return my raging love thought is but madness life is pain and thus at once i both remove oh stay one moment chloe said and trembling haste to the door here betty quick a pale dear maid this madman else will stain the floor End quote. in every way the editor sought to inject a vein of humor into his columns a sample news item runs quote, an unhappy man one sturgis upon some difference with his wife determined to drown himself in the river and she kind wife went with him it seems to see it faithfully performed and accordingly stood by silent and unconcerned during the whole transaction he jumped in near carpenter's wharf but was timely taken out again before what he came about was thoroughly affected so that they were both obliged to return home as they came and put up for that time with with the disappointment end quote. in another issue printing the fact that a bucks county farmer had his pewter buttons melted off his waistband by a flash of lightning he adds the comment tis well nothing else thereabouts was made of pewter how he made jokes of his own typographical errors and how he joked his fellow editors has been told already and his quickness to seize an opportunity is shown by a very typical reply to one of these in a letter addressed to himself Quote, mr franklin i am the author of a copy of verses in the last mercury it was my real intention to appear open and not basely with my vizard on attack a man who had fairly unmasked accordingly i subscribed my name at full length in my manuscript sent to my brother b d but he for some incomprehensible reason inserted the two initial letters only viz b l tis true every syllable of the performance discovers me to be the author but as i meet with much censure on the occasion i request you to inform the public that i did not desire my name should be concealed and that the remaining letters are o c k h e a d end quote his irresistible inclination to screw a joke out of everything is illustrated by the scrapes he got himself into with his advertisers employed to print an announcement of the sailing of a ship he added an n b of his own to the effect that among the passengers quote, no sea hens nor black gowns will be admitted on any terms end quote. some of the clergy properly incensed withdrew their subscriptions from the gazette yet this did not cure him of the tendency and he was quickly offending again one alexander miller peruke maker in second street philadelphia by advertisement acquainted his customers that he intended to quote, leave off the shaving business after the twenty second of august next end quote and the paper having an overplus of space franklin proceeded to tag on to this notification a humorous article on barbers who he pointed out were peculiarly fitted for politics not because of that particular part of their calling but because they were also adept shavers and trimmers 
quote, which will naturally lead us to consider the near relation which subsists between shaving, trimming, and politics, end quote. And congratulating the people upon his advertised retirement of the barber, he continued, I am of opinion that all possible encouragement ought to be given to examples of this kind, end quote. It is not surprising that the innocent advertiser resented this, and the printer was called upon to explain. I had no animosity, Franklin wrote, against the person whose advertisement I made the motto of my paper, and he expressed surprise that my paper on shavers and trimmers in the last gazette should be generally condemned, which he at first imputed to a, quote, want of taste and relish for pieces of that force and beauty which none but a university-bred gentleman can produce, end quote. But upon advice of friends, quote, whose judgment I could depend upon, end quote, he thought it best to express regret and promise reformation. A pleasant quality of this love of humor was that Franklin was ever as ready to joke at his own expense as at another's. On Thursday last, the Gazette informed its readers, a certain P-R, tis not customary to give names at length on these occasions, walking carefully in clean clothes over some barrels of tar on Carpenter's Wharf, the head of one of them unluckily gave way, and let a leg of him in above the knee. Whether he was upon the catch at the time, we cannot say, but T is certain he caught a tartar. T was observed, he sprang out again right briskly, verifying the common saying, as nimble as a bee in a tar barrel. You must know there are several sorts of bees. Tis true he was no honey bee, nor yet a humble bee, but a boo bee he may be allowed to be, namely B. F. So, to teach a moral, he wrote his fable of the whistle, telling of how, quote, when I was a child of seven years old, my friends on a holiday filled my pocket with coppers. I went directly to a shop where they sold toys for children, and being charmed with the sound of a whistle that I met by the way in the hands of another boy, I voluntarily offered and gave all my money for one. I then came home and went whistling all over the house, much pleased with my whistle, but disturbing the family. My brothers and sisters and cousins, understanding the bargain I had made, told me I had given four times as much for it as it was worth, put me in mind of what good things I might have bought with the rest of the money, and laughed at me so much for my folly that I cried with vexation, and the reflection gave me more chagrin than the whistle gave me pleasure. This, however, was afterwards of use to me, the impression continuing on in my mind, so that often, when I was tempted to buy some unnecessary thing, I said to myself, Don't give too much for the whistle, and I saved my money. End quote. Better still was an incident which proves him truly an incorrigible joker. Two nights ago, he states, being about to kill a turkey by the shock from two large glass jars containing as much electrical fire as forty common files, I inadvertently took the hole through my own arms and body by receiving the fire from the united top wires with one hand, while the other held a chain connected to the outsides of both jars. The company present, whose talking to me and to one another, I suppose, occasioned my inattention to what I was about— say that the flash was very great and the crack as loud as a pistol yet my senses being instantly gone i neither saw the one nor heard the other nor did i feel the stroke on my hand i felt what i know not how well to describe a universal blow throughout my whole body from head to foot which seemed within as well as without after which the first thing I took notice of was a violent, quick shaking of my body, which gradually remitting, my sense as gradually returned. End quote. Yet the moment he became conscious enough to realize what had occurred, he remarked, Well, I meant to kill a turkey, and instead I nearly killed a goose. As he made fun of his errors, so he did of his triumphs. Poverty, poetry, and new titles of honor make men ridiculous, he once wrote, and in communicating to a friend the fact that the King of France had sent him his thanks and compliments for his useful discoveries in electricity, he prefaced it with the story from the tattler of a girl who was observed to grow suddenly proud, and none could guess the reason till it came to be known that she had got on a pair of new silk garters. 
lest you should be puzzled to guess the cause when you observe anything of the kind in me i think i will not hide my new garters under my petticoats but take the freedom to show them to you End quote but his supreme self-joking was his turning his own physical torture into something to furnish his friend's amusement you know he wrote one of these that madame le gout has given me good advice often and while suffering from the disease he penned his dialogue between franklin and the gout one of his most delightful pieces of persiflage of which unfortunately owing to its length only the beginning and the end can be quoted quote, midnight twenty second october seventeen eighty franklin eh ooh eh what have i done to merit these cruel sufferings the gout many things you have ate and drank too freely and too much indulged those legs of yours in their indolence franklin who is it that accuses me the gout it is i even i the gout franklin what my enemy in person the gout no not your enemy franklin i repeat it my enemy for you would not only torment my body to death but ruin my good name you reproach me as a glutton and a tippler now all the world that knows me will allow that i am neither the one nor the other the gout the world may think as it pleases it is always very complacent to itself and sometimes to its friends but i very well know that the quantity of meat and drink proper for a man who takes a reasonable degree of exercise would be too much for another who never takes any franklin ah how tiresome you are the gout well then to my office it should not be forgotten that i am your physician there franklin oh what a devil of a physician the gout how ungrateful you are to say so is it not i in the character of your physician have saved you from the palsy dropsy and apoplexy one or other of which would have done for you long ago but for me franklin i submit and thank you for the past but entreat the discontinuance of your visits for the future for in my mind one had better die than be cured so dolefully permit me just to hint that i have also not been unfriendly to you i never feed physician or quack of any kind to enter the list against you if then you do not leave me to my repose it may be said you are ungrateful too the gout i can scarcely acknowledge that as any objection as to quacks i despise them they may kill you indeed but cannot injure me and as to regular physicians they are at last convinced that the gout in such a subject as you are is no disease but a remedy and wherefore cure a remedy but to our business there oh oh for heaven's sake leave me and i promise faithfully never more to play at chess but to take exercise daily and live temperately the gout i know you too well you promise fair but after a few months of good health you will return to your old habits your fine promises will be forgotten like the forms of last year's clouds let us then finish the account and i will go but i leave you with an assurance of visiting you again at a proper time and place for my object is your good and you are sensible now that i am your real friend End quote one very noticeable quality of all franklin's humor is that poke fun as he would at himself he rarely did so at others not once in twenty was his humor aimed at an individual and he appears in this to have regarded poor richard's warnings that thou canst not joke an enemy into a friend but thou mayest a friend into an enemy that joke went out and brought home his fellow and they two began to quarrel and that he makes a foe who makes a jest End quote. as need scarcely be said it is poor richard's almanac which embodies the bulk of the humor originated by franklin in his day the great source of profit to every printer was the almanac which was issued yearly and which was the veiled mecum in every household that could spare the necessary two or three pence annually and so when franklin set up his press he arranged with thomas godfrey a local scientist of some note to furnish him with the copy for an annual issue 
presently however mrs godfrey by her matchmaking schemes became the discordia as already told if the young printer took philosophically the broken heart the resulting broken friendship was more serious for he not only lost godfrey as his tenant but the fellow math carried his manuscript to a rival printer and franklin was left in the lurch for his copy in this predicament he apparently wrote his own almanac but knowing that his name would hardly give it currency among readers who still looked upon it as dealing in magic witchcraft and astrology he adopted that of richard saunder an english philomath of the seventeenth century of great popularity but since quite eclipsed by his more popular western namesake under this name therefore the initial number was issued in the latter part of december seventeen thirty two when in spite of the late publication three impressions were called for by the popular demand and from that time it was not merely the most esteemed almanac in pennsylvania but had a sale as far north as rhode island and as far south as the carolinas and indeed it was the first american publication which broke through colonial boundaries the secret of its success was its humor the calculations were no more accurate the poetry no better nor the printing clearer than were those of the half a dozen competitors which then came from the pennsylvania presses but in the colorless life of the frontier settlements the advent of this little pamphlet of a dozen leaves was one of the events of the year and it is not strange that the sense and nonsense of poor richard which afterward gained such a place and name in the literary centres of europe should surpass its competitors and keep the presses busy printing the ten thousand copies annually called for the humor was everywhere in the advertisement that announced its publication in the title page and preface sprinkled in the calendar the weather predictions the eclipses and the prophecies here for instance is the way he announced the eclipses in the year seventeen thirty four there will be but two the first april twenty second eighteen minutes after five in the morning the second october fifteenth thirty-six minutes past one in the afternoon both of the sun and both like mrs s s modesty and old neighbor scrapeall's money invisible or like a certain storekeeper late of blank county not to be seen in these parts not the least element of the popularity was due to the controversies with his brother philomaths which franklin originated by his jocose remarks upon them in the prefaces of poor richard with delightful humor and satire mr saunders in different issues gravely predicts the death of one of his rivals titan leeds and the reconciliation of a second john german to the catholic church neither of these gentlemen though able to predict weather twelve months in advance could draw from the stars franklin's purpose and so they fell into his trap and in the prefaces to their respective issues they replied to him with anger and strong words leeds called him a fool and a liar and a conceited scribbler which german echoed in no minor key by stating that franklin's prediction was altogether false and untrue and that he was one of Baal's false prophets this was just what franklin expected and he used his opportunity to the utmost with wit and humor he fanned the flames of controversy to which his rivals replied with bad language and adjectives he made every reader of leeds and german hear of and wish to see poor richard and once seen it was a very clodpage who could not discriminate between texts one of which has been translated into a dozen languages while the other has barely survived on the shelves of the antiquary this ends chapter ten part one chapter ten part two of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter ten the humorist part two what made poor richard a byword throughout the colonies however were the scraps of wit and wisdom with which franklin filled in any little blanks in the text in his autobiography he tells us that quote, observing it was generally read scarce any neighborhood in the province being without it i considered it as a proper vehicle for conveying instruction among the common people who bought scarcely any other books 
i therefore filled all the little spaces between the remarkable days in the calendar with proverbial sentences chiefly such as inculcated industry and frugality as the means of procuring wealth and thereby securing virtue it being more difficult for a man in want to act always honestly as to use here one of these proverbs it is hard for an empty sack to stand up right it is hardly necessary to state that franklin did not originate all the sayings of poor richard he himself affirmed that they were the wisdom of many ages and nations and again disclaimed all originality by remarking that not a tenth part of this wisdom was my own but rather the gleanings i had made of all ages and nations any one familiar with bacon rochefoucauld and rabelais as well as others will recognize old friends in some of these sayings while a study of the collections of proverbs made in the early part of the last century by ray palmer and others will reveal the probable source from which poor richard pilfered yet many of these maxims and aphorisms had been filtered through franklin's brain and were tinged with that mother wit which strongly and individually marks so much that he said and wrote and those of which he was himself the originator rank with the best of the world's philosophy as the following specimens will evidence time eateth all things could old poets say but times are changed our times drink all away you may drive a gift without a gimlet here comes glib tongue who can outflatter a dedication and lie like ten epitaphs one man may be more cunning than another but not more cunning than everyone else mankind are very old creatures one half censure what they practice the other half practices what they censure the rest always say and do as they ought a hundred thieves cannot strike one naked man, especially if his skin's off. Money and man a mutual friendship show. Man makes false money. Money makes man so. Mary's mouth costs her nothing, for she never opens it but at others' expense. A doubtful meaning. If female kind is counted ill, and is indeed the contrary, no man can find that hurt they will, but everywhere show charity. To nobody, malicious still, in word or deed, believe you me. He that is of opinion money will do everything may well be suspected of doing everything for money. A rich rogue is like a fat hog, who never does good till as dead as a log. He does not possess wealth, it possesses him. He that falls in love with himself will have no rivals. Women are books, and men the readers be, who sometimes in those books erratas see. Yet oft the readers, raptured with each line, fair print and paper, fraught with sense divine, though some neglectful seldom care to read, and faithful wives no more than Bibles heed are women books says hodge then would mine were an almanac to change her every year the cunning man steals a horse the wise man lets him alone onions can make even heirs and widows weep necessity has no law i know some attorneys of the same for twenty-five years franklin compiled and printed this almanac and in the last issue edited by him being for the year seventeen fifty eight he contributed a preface to which almost the entire knowledge of poor richard by the world is due it was in effect a skimming of the cream from the twenty-four previous issues being a selection of aphorisms rhymes and jokes run in a continuous piece which was described by franklin as follows these proverbs i assembled and formed into a connected discourse prefixed to the almanac of seventeen fifty seven sick as the harangue of a wise old man to the people attending an auction the bringing all these scattered counsels thus into a focus enabled them to make greater impression the piece being universally approved was copied in all the newspapers of the continent reprinted in britain on a broadside to be stuck up in houses two translations were made of it in french and great numbers were bought by the clergy and gentry to distribute gratis among their poor parishioners and tenants 
it is this preface which has given the name of poor richard currency in alien races and a quotable quality to this day it has been printed and reprinted again and again in every size from the pot duodecimo up to the imperial folio in thousands for the ploughboy and in limited and privately printed editions at the expense of noblemen for the penny horrible hawker and for the bibliomaniac for the society for preserving property against republicans and levellers and for the association for improving the condition of the poor and under the titles of father abraham's speech the way to wealth la science du bonhomme richard it has proved itself one of the most popular american writings seventy-five editions of it have been printed in english fifty-six in french eleven in german and nine in italian it has been translated into spanish danish swedish welsh polish gaelic russian bohemian dutch catalan chinese modern greek and phonetic writing it has been printed at least four hundred times and is today as popular as ever franklin was as much a wit with tongue as he was with pen and there are innumerable instances of his ready replies to a philadelphia neighbor who complained to him that people would steal into his yard and tap a keg of small beer which he kept there and who consulted him on a means to prevent it he replied put a pipe of madeira alongside it when the declaration of independence was being signed and harrison said that the congress must hang together in its defense franklin jocosely remarked yes we must all hang together or we shall all hang separately in france when lord stormont the british ambassador circulated the report that a large part of washington's army had surrendered and franklin was asked if it were true he replied no sir it is not a truth it is only a stormont and from that time the poor ambassador's name was used in paris as the equivalent of a lie upon the news arriving that general howe had captured philadelphia franklin gave another turn to the disaster and cheered the american partisans by retorting no philadelphia has captured howe a version not merely witty but which time proved truthful in his contest with the pen proprietors one evening at the governor's franklin relates quote, in gay conversation over our wine after supper he told us jokingly that he much admired the idea of sancho panza who when it was proposed to give him a government requested it might be a government of blacks as then if he could not agree with his people he might sell them one of his friends who sat next to me says franklin why do you continue to side with the damned quakers had not you better sell them the proprietor would give you a good price the governor says i has not yet blacked them enough as the bon mot about stormont shows franklin was something of a punster when it was suggested to him that peerages and pensions would be given to those who might bring about a re-establishment of the dependence of the colonies he answered you will give us pensions probably to be paid too out of your expected american revenue and which none of us can accept without deserving and perhaps obtaining a suspension but the very neatest twixt is connected with his right of franking letters while deputy postmaster general under the crown he wrote on the back of his letters free b franklin but when the Continental Congress appointed him to the same office, he changed the form and wrote, Be free, Franklin. He encouraged a punster, too, by writing him that Your string of puns made us very merry, adding, You will allow me to claim a little merit or demerit in the last, as having had some hand in making you a punster, but the wit of the first is keen and all your own. End quote to nineteenth-century palates some of poor richard is coarse and vulgar but the times rather than the author should bear the blame so there are other humorous writings of his so certain to shock modern taste that they have never been printed in his collected works one which by surreptitious additions has acquired much currency was pretendedly a letter of advice to a young man on his conduct to women but was only a bit of fooling never seriously intended a second is a satire on the silly conduct of some learned societies in discussing trivial questions 
a preface to one of his almanacs is on the whole the worst of the three because printed yet presumably it was mightily enjoyed and scarcely disapproved of by those who purchased it his speech of polly baker if written in the plainest anglo-saxon and if given a humorous turn is but such a protest as the noblest men and women have more seriously and with more careful choice of words uttered against laws and customs that pillory the fallen woman and leave unpunished the partner in her sin it is not to be denied that in a certain way franklin let his sense of fun overcome what was appropriate and dignified thus when he was in command on the frontier in seventeen fifty six quote, we had for our chaplain a zealous presbyterian minister mr Beatty, who complained to me that the men did not generally attend his prayers and exhortations when they enlisted they were promised besides pay and provisions a gill of rum a day which was punctually served out to them half in the morning and the other half in the evening and i observed they were very punctual in attending to receive it upon which i said to mr Beatty, it is perhaps below the dignity of your profession to act as steward of the rum but if you were to deal it out and only just after prayers you would have them all about you he liked the thought undertook the office and with the help of a few hands to measure out the liquor executed it to satisfaction and never were prayers more generally and more punctually attended so that i thought this method preferable to the punishment inflicted by some military laws for non-attendance on divine service End quote. with more justification and probably in this case with intentional burlesquing he wrote of the society of the cincinnati badge quote, others object to the bald eagle as looking too much like a dindon or a turkey for my own part i wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country he is a bird of bad moral character he does not get his living honestly you may have seen him perched on some dead tree where too lazy to fish for himself he watches the labor of the fishing hawk and when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish and is bearing it to his nest for the support of his mate and young ones the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him with all this injustice he is never in good case but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing he is generally poor and often very lousy besides he is a rank coward the little king-bird not bigger than a sparrow attacks him boldly and drives him out of the district i am on this account not displeased that the figure is not known as a bald eagle but looks more like a turkey for in truth the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird and withal a true original native of america End quote allusion has already been made to his political satires all of which had a more or less humorous turn so he often adopted the same vein in his non-political articles here for instance is his method of making clear the misinformation which the british press then as now delighted to print concerning america pretendedly a counter-denial of a contradiction Quote, dear sir do not let us suffer ourselves to be amused with such groundless objections the very tails of the american sheep are so laden with wool that each has a little car or wagon on four little wheels to support and keep it from trailing on the ground would they caulk their ships would they even litter their horses with wool if it were not both plenty and cheap and yet all this is as certainly true as the account said to be from quebec in all the papers of last week that the inhabitants of canada are making preparations for a cod and whale fishery this summer in the upper lakes ignorant people may object that the upper lakes are fresh and that cod and whales are salt-water fish but let them know sir that cod like other fish when attacked by their enemies fly into any water where they can be safest that whales when they have a mind to eat cod pursue them wherever they fly and that the grand leap of the whale in the chase up the falls of niagara is esteemed by all who have seen it as one of the finest spectacles in nature End quote as franklin was a wit so he was a story-teller the doctor miss adams noted is always silent unless he has some diverting story to tell of which he has a great collection 
you know he himself reminded a friend everything puts me in mind of a story some few of these selected at random will serve to indicate how habitual it was to him insisting on the necessity of careful preliminary work in science he told a correspondent that quote, this prudence of not attempting to give reasons before one is sure of facts i learned from one of your sex who as selden tells us being in company with some gentlemen that were viewing and considering something which they called a chinese shoe and disputing earnestly about the manner of wearing it and how it could possibly be put on put in her word and said modestly gentlemen are you sure it is a shoe should that not be settled first End quote weary of a public matter to which he had given much time he said i begin to be a little of a sailor's mind when they were handing a cable out of a store into a ship and one of them said tis a long heavy cable i wish we could see the end of it damn me says another if i believe it has any end somebody has cut it off End quote. in reply to a letter of extravagant thanks he remarked that it quote, put me in mind of the story of the member of parliament who began one of his speeches with saying he thanked god that he was born and bred a presbyterian on which another took leave to observe that the gentleman must needs be of a most grateful disposition since he was thankful for such very small matters End quote. protesting against the folly of duelling he cited the case of a gentleman in a coffee-house who desired another to sit farther from him why so because sir you stink that is an affront and you must fight me i will fight you if you insist upon it but i do not see how that will mend the matter for if you kill me i shall stink too and if i kill you you will stink if possible worse than you do at present End quote describing his own country and the absence of a leisure class because idleness was deemed disreputable he declared that quote, the husbandman is in honor there and even the mechanic because their employments are useful the people have a saying that god almighty is himself a mechanic the greatest in the universe and he is respected and admired more for the variety ingenuity and utility of his handiworks than for the antiquity of his family they are pleased with the observation of a negro and frequently mention it that bocarara meaning that white man make de black man work make de horse work make de ox work make everything work only de hog he de hog no worker he eat he drink he walk about he go to sleep when he please he live like a gentleman these innumerable stories had great currency in their time and went from mouth to mouth not always as franklin told them correcting one of these versions he capped one story with another by writing quote, as you observe there was no swearing in the story of the poker when i told it the late new dresser of it was probably the same or perhaps akin to him who in relating a dispute that happened between queen anne and the archbishop of canterbury concerning a vacant mitre which the queen was for bestowing on a person the archbishop thought unworthy made both the queen and the archbishop swear three or four thumping oaths in every sentence of the discussion and the archbishop at last gained his point one present at this tale being surprised said but did the queen and the archbishop swear so at one another oh no no said the relator that is only my way of telling the story franklin continued to joke to the very end for when the burden of years and pain was resting heavily upon him he told a friend who dwelt on the need of his country for his services our story of the harrow Quote, a farmer in our country sent two of his servants to borrow one of a neighbor ordering them to bring it between them on their shoulders when they came to look at it one of them who had much wit and cunning said what could our master mean by sending only two men to bring this harrow no two men upon earth are strong enough to carry it pooh said the other who was vain of his strength what do you talk of two men one man can carry it help it on my shoulders and see as he proceeded with it the wag kept exclaiming zounds how strong you are i could not have thought it why you are a samson there is no such another man in america what amazing strength god has given you but you will kill yourself pray put it down and rest a little or let me bear a part of the weight 
no no said he being more encouraged by the compliments than oppressed by the burden you shall see i carry it quite home and so he did in this particular i am afraid my part of the imitation will fall short of the original life like a dramatic piece he once wrote should not only be conducted with regularity but methinks it should finish handsomely being now in the last act i begin to cast about for something fit to end with or if mine be more properly compared to an epigram as some of its lines are but barely tolerable i am very desirous of concluding with a bright point this ends chapter ten of franklin the humorist chapter eleven part one of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter eleven politician and diplomat part one the first mistake in public business is the going into it remarked poor richard and the worldly wise sage was speaking from the experience which keeps a dear school for franklin when he penned the sentence had been over twenty years a public servant the admonition however was little heeded for he continued to hold office almost unceasingly to the end of his days i have heard he said of some great man whose rule it was with regard to offices never to ask for them and never to refuse them to which i have always added in my own practice never to resign them End quote. on another occasion he asserted not altogether truthfully i have never solicited for a public office either for myself or any relation yet i never refused one that i was capable of executing when a public service was in question and i never bargained for salary but contented myself with whatever my constituents were pleased to allow me End quote franklin's entrance into politics may be said to date from his beginning to print the pennsylvania gazette for he relates quote, the leading men seeing a newspaper now in the hands of one who could also handle a pen thought it convenient to oblige and encourage me End quote. and they gave him as already told the public printing the same year he secured the favor of the populace in another way about this time there was a cry among the people for more paper money and franklin taking advantage of it wrote and printed an anonymous pamphlet entitled the nature and necessity of a paper currency which quote, was well received by the common people in general but the rich men disliked it for it increased and strengthened the clamor for more money and they happening to have no writers among them that were able to answer it their opposition slackened and the point was carried by a majority in the house End quote. In his twenty years' active labor at his press, the printer succeeded in making it a producer of wealth, but at this time he had yet to learn the lesson that value is made by material and labor, and not by words and promises. Later in life, his intercourse with Hume, Price, Turgot, Mirabeau, and, most of all, with Adam Smith, who submitted each chapter of his Wealth of Nations as he composed it to Franklin for discussion and criticism, opened his eyes to the truths that every paper dollar issued banishes or takes out of circulation a metal one, so long as there is one left, and that beyond that, however the printing presses may be worked, there will be no more money, the total value of the mass decreasing as rapidly as the volume is swelled, and in excessive issues tending even to fall so sharply as to produce an actual contraction not augmentation in the standard of value i lament with you he told a friend in speaking of the continental currency the many mischiefs the injustice the corruption of manners etc that attended a depreciating currency it is some consolation to me that i washed my hands of that evil by predicting it in congress and proposing means that would have been effectual to prevent it if they had been adopted subsequent operations that i have executed demonstrate that my plan was practicable but it was unfortunately rejected End quote. 
however erroneous the economic views of the young printer might be they brought franklin into political notice and in seventeen thirty six he was chosen clerk of the general assembly without opposition a place of value aside from its salary he states because it gave him quote, a better opportunity of keeping up an interest among the members which secured to me the business of printing the votes laws paper money and other occasional jobs for the public that on the whole were very profitable End quote. the year following he was reappointed but not unanimously a new member making a long speech against him this opposition disturbed the office-holder and he sought to placate its originator not by servile respect but by a very typical artifice quote, having heard that he had in his library a certain very scarce and curious book i wrote a note to him expressing my desire of perusing that book and requesting he would do me the favour of lending it to me for a few days he sent it immediately and i returned it in about a week with another note expressing strongly my sense of the favour when we next met in the house he spoke to me which he had never done before and with great civility and he ever after manifested a readiness to serve me on all occasions so that we became great friends and our friendship continued to his death this is another instance of the truth of an old maxim i had learned which says quote, he that has once done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged and it shows how much more profitable it is prudently to remove than to resent return and continue inimical proceedings End quote. i now began franklin relates to turn my thoughts a little to public affairs and in succession set about methods for bettering the city watch the fire service and somewhat later the cleaning and paving of the streets End quote in seventeen thirty seven as already told he was made postmaster of philadelphia which brought him forward yet more prominently but most of all it was his pamphlet plain truth which though it bore somewhat hard on both parties had the happiness not to give much offence to either that may be said to have made a public man of him the share i had in the late association and so forth he wrote having given me a little present run of popularity there was a pretty general intention of choosing me a representative of the city at the next election of the assemblymen but i have desired all my friends who spoke to me about it to discourage it declaring that i should not serve if chosen End quote his wish to keep out of office was idle however the governor made him a justice of the peace this office franklin says i tried a little by attending a few courts and sitting on the bench to hear causes but finding that more knowledge of the common law than i possessed was necessary to act in that station with credit i gradually withdrew from it End quote the corporation of the city elected him to the common council and later to the office of alderman an honor of which his mother doubtingly wrote quote, i am glad to hear you are so well respected in your town for them to choose you an alderman although i don't know what it means or what the better you will be of it besides the honor of it End quote. nor did his plea avail to save him from election to the assembly for quote, the citizens at large chose me a burgess to represent them and my election to this trust was repeated every year for ten years without my ever asking any elector for his vote or signifying either directly or indirectly any desire of being chosen despite his endeavors to escape the office he confesses that quote, the station was agreeable to me as i was at length tired of sitting there to hear debates in which as clerk i could take no part and which were often so unentertaining that i was induced to amuse myself with making magic squares or circles or anything to avoid weariness End quote. from this election to the assembly dates the real beginning of franklin as a political influence yet in a very brief space of time he made himself one of the dominant factors entering the arena on the question of public defence he was quickly in opposition to the penn brothers the proprietors of the colony the moot point being the question of taxing the proprietary lands 
the popular view was that their lands should bear an equal share and franklin became the leader of the party advocating this his chief opponents being the office holders and gentry and for years the contest was waged with a bitterness and vituperation unexampled in colonial politics without the aristocratic party being able to defeat him or to prevent him from carrying his measures at last however aided by some assistance from him they compassed their endeavour in seventeen sixty four the frontiersmen chiefly scotch-irish believing that the quaker influence in the assembly prevented proper measures being taken for the defence of the borders from the hostile indians deliberately massacred a small village men women and children of peaceful and semi-civilized indians in the interior of the colony the remnants of the tribe which had welcomed and made the treaty with penn their only crime as franklin said being that they had a reddish-brown skin and black hair the brutality of the deed fired franklin and he wrote an account of it perhaps the most righteously angry paper he ever penned in which he mercilessly lashed and well-nigh cursed the christian white savages of peckstang and donegal this was enough to consolidate the presbyterian party not merely on the frontier but in the city against him and in the election of seventeen sixty four they united themselves with the proprietary faction you can scarcely conceive he told a friend the number of bitter enemies that little piece has raised me among the irish presbyterians another publication of franklin's too served to gain the coalition of yet a third class of voters some years before in a strictly scientific pamphlet he had philosophized on the question of immigration and asked why should the palatine boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours why should pennsylvania founded by the english become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to germanize us this was reprinted now to injure him with that people and succeeded only too well yet though the irish and german votes were thus united against him a combination almost unfailingly successful in america and though he was pelted with pamphlets broadsides and caricatures impugning his every public act and laying bare his private life his hold was so great with the masses that he would have been re-elected but for an error of judgment in the party managers a graphic account of the struggle was written by a pennsylvanian quote, the poll was opened about nine in the morning the first of october and the steps so crowded till between eleven and twelve at night that at no time could a person get up in less than a quarter of an hour from his entrance at the bottom for they could go no faster than the whole column moved about three in the morning the advocates for the new ticket moved for a close but oh fatal mistake the old hands kept it open as they had a reserve of the aged and the lame which could not come in the crowd and were called up and brought out in chairs and litters and some who needed no help between three and six o'clock about two hundred voters as both sides took care to have spies all night the alarm was given to the new ticket men horsemen and footmen were immediately dispatched to germantown etc and by nine or ten o'clock they began to pour in so that after the move for a close seven or eight hundred votes were procured about five hundred or near it of which were for the new ticket and they did not close till three in the afternoon and it took them till one next day to count them off End quote the incident is one of peculiar interest because it is the only time franklin ever failed of an election and indeed his political success was so uniform that a quaker demanded of a mutual acquaintance friend joseph didst thee ever know dr franklin to be in a minority yet though defeat is hardest to the most successful he seems to have taken it well mr franklin continued the above narrator died like a philosopher and writing of his opposition to the paxton rioters and of the resulting political effect the defeated assemblyman said 
quote, I had by this transaction made myself many enemies among the populace, and the governor, with whose family our public disputes had long placed me in an unfriendly light, and the services I had lately rendered him not being of the kind that make a man acceptable, thinking it a favorable opportunity, joined the whole weight of the proprietary interest to get me out of the assembly, which was accordingly effected at the last election by a majority of about twenty-five and four thousand voters. The triumph to the proprietary party was more apparent than real. Though they had succeeded in defeating Franklin, they had not been able to beat his party, for, quote, the other counties returned nearly the same members who had served them before, so that the old faction had still a considerable majority in the House, end quote. The assembly, therefore, when met, chose Franklin its agent to go to Great Britain with a petition to the king that he end the proprietary government. So all his opponents had accomplished was to place him in a position to do them infinitely more injury than would have been possible had he been re-elected to the assembly. Once already Franklin had been appointed agent of the colony for a similar service, and the importance of these two visits to Great Britain is scarcely to be magnified it was not that he was able to accomplish all he endeavored for his colony though in the first mission he had been fairly successful but that they brought him into relations with many of the leading men of england immeasurably broadened his horizon and trained him in diplomacy when in seventeen seventy six congress sent him across the water to enter into relations with france it was not a raw untrained negotiator who went but one schooled by fourteen years of the most difficult kind of diplomatic service for colony agents unlike foreign ministers were compelled to plead their causes and compass their ends without the argument of the armies and fleets which are so influential a factor in international disputes Yet so successfully did he perform this difficult task that Pennsylvania rechose him year after year, and in succession Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Georgia voted him their agent, so that in time he came to be the representative of four of the colonies. Warmly attached as Franklin was to Pennsylvania, he never seems to have been swayed by local interests, as was so common in his time. As early as 1751, he foresaw that a union of the colonies was necessary and was thinking out methods for overcoming provincial prejudices and antipathies while marveling that the, quote, six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for such an union and be able to execute it in such a manner as that it has subsisted ages and appears indissoluble and yet that a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen english colonies to whom it is more necessary and must be more advantageous and who cannot be supposed to want an equal understanding of their interests end quote when news came early in seventeen fifty four that the french had driven the english from the forks of the monongahela he wrote an editorial comment in which he warned the people that the enemy would never have dared to commit the aggression but for the quote, present disunited state of the british colonies and the extreme difficulty of bringing so many different governments and assemblies to agree to any speedy and effectual measures for our common defence and security while our enemies have the very great advantage of being under one direction with one council and one purse End quote. Then he added a cut symbolizing the condition, which attained such instant popularity that it was frequently reprinted, and which again was used with telling effect at the outbreak of the Revolution and when the Federal Constitution was under discussion. Only a few days after this warning, Franklin went to work to put his idea into concrete form. He had been named one of the commissioners to negotiate a war alliance with the Six Nations, and, on his way to the meeting, so he states, quote, I projected and drew a plan for the union of all the colonies under one government, so far as might be necessary for defense and other important general purposes. By this plan, the general government was to be administered by a president-general, appointed and supported by the crown, and a grand council was to be chosen by the representatives of the people of the several colonies, met in their respective assemblies. Many objections and difficulties were started, but at length they were all overcome, and the plan was unanimously agreed upon, and copies ordered to be transmitted to the Board of Trade and to the assemblies of the several provinces. 
its fate was singular the assemblies did not adopt it as they all thought there was too much prerogative in it and in england it was judged to have too much of the democratic the different and contrary reasons of dislike to my plan make me suspect that it was really the true medium and i am still of opinion it would have been happy for both sides the water if it had been adopted the colonies so united would have been sufficiently strong to have defended themselves there would then have been no need of troops from england of course the subsequent pretense for taxing america and the bloody contest it occasioned would have been avoided but such mistakes are not new history is full of errors of states and princes End quote. franklin was too inherently a statesman not to look further than the mere union of the american colonies and almost from his entrance into public affairs he was considering the relation between the colonies and the mother country and striving to find means to maintain it years before ill feeling had been developed he declared i have long been of opinion that the foundations of the future grandeur and stability of the british empire lie in america and though like other foundations they are low and little now they are nevertheless broad and strong enough to support the greatest political structure that human wisdom ever yet erected with the increase of the colonies he predicted a vast demand is growing for british manufactures a glorious market wholly in the power of britain in which foreigners cannot interfere which will increase in a short time even beyond her power of supplying though her whole trade should be to her colonies therefore britain should not too much restrain manufactures in her colonies a wise and good mother will not do it to distress is to weaken and weakening the children weakens the whole family End quote. and with true prescience he wrote quote, it has long appeared to me that the only true british policy was that which aimed at the good of the whole british empire not that which sought the advantage of one part in the disadvantage of the other therefore all measures of procuring gain to the mother country arise from loss to her colonies and all of gain to the colonies arising from or occasioning loss to britain especially where the gain was small and the loss great every abridgment of the power of the mother country where that power was not prejudicial to the liberties of the colonists and every diminution of the privileges of the colonists where they were not prejudicial to the welfare of the mother country i in my own mind condemned as improper partial unjust and mischievous tending to create dissensions and weaken that union on which the strength solidity and duration of the empire greatly depended End quote. this ends chapter eleven part one Chapter 11, Part 2 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 11, Politician and Diplomat, Part 2. As this implied, Franklin was a warm partisan of the connection between Great Britain and her colonies. Even after the Stamp and Revenue Acts should have shown him how selfishly bent on her own narrow interest the mother country was, he ascribed those measures solely to the corrupt Parliament and expressed the hope that, quote, nothing that has happened or may happen will diminish in the least our loyalty to our sovereign or affection for this nation in general. I can scarcely conceive a king of better dispositions, of more exemplary virtues, or more truly desirous of promoting the welfare of all his subjects. The experience we have had of the family in the two preceding mild reigns, and the good temper of our young princes, so far as can yet be discovered, promise us a continuance of this felicity." End quote as for the colonies he said they had not only a respect but an affection for great britain for its laws its customs and manners and even a fondness for its fashions that greatly increased the commerce natives of britain were always treated with particular regard to be an old england man was of itself a character of some respect and gave a kind of rank among us End quote. Thus he wrote when America was ablaze with opposition to the parliamentary acts, but still he could assert, quote, 
and yet there remains among the people so much respect veneration and affection for britain that if cultivated prudently with a kind usage and tenderness for their privileges they might be easily governed still for ages without force or any considerable expense but i do not see here a sufficient quantity of wisdom that is necessary to produce such a conduct and i lament the want of it End quote. in answer to the charge that the colonies desired independence he replied the americans have too much love for their mother country and he assured lord chatham that quote, having more than once travelled almost from one end of the continent to the other and kept a great variety of company eating drinking and conversing with them freely i never had heard in any conversation from any person drunk or sober the least expression of a wish for a separation or hint that such a thing would be advantageous to america End quote feeling this strong loyalty himself franklin worked unendingly to prevent the breach convinced as he was that the government cannot long be maintained without the union of the two he retorted when it was urged that in time the colonies by their growth would become the dominant half quote, which is best supposing your case to have a total separation or a change of the seat of government End quote early and late he preached the necessity of a closer union but it fell on ears deafened by self and immediate interests and he was forced to acknowledge that all his arguments were in vain for quote, the parliament here do at present think too highly of themselves to admit representatives from us if we should ask it and when they will be desirous of granting it we shall think too highly of ourselves to accept it it would certainly contribute to the strength of the whole if ireland and all the dominions were united and consolidated under one common council for general purposes each retaining its particular council or parliament for its domestic concerns but this should have been early provided for in the infancy of our foreign establishments it was neglected or was not thought of and now the affair is nearly in the situation of friar bacon's project of making a brazen wall around england for its eternal security his servant friar bungie slept while the brazen head which was to dictate how it might be done said time is and time was he only waked to hear it say time is past an explosion followed that tumbled their house about the conjurer's ears End quote if such a union he argued were now established which methinks it highly imports this country to establish it would probably subsist as long as britain shall continue as a nation this people however is too proud and too much despises the americans to bear the thought of admitting them to such an equitable participation in the government of the whole every man in england he complained seems to consider himself as a piece of a sovereign over america seems to jostle himself into the throne with the king and talks of our subjects in the colonies and with real indignation he charged that quote, angry writers use their utmost efforts to persuade us that this war with the colonies for a war it will be is a national curse when in fact it is a ministerial one End quote the british he maintained have no idea that any people can act from any other principle but that of interest and they believe that three pence in a pound of tea of which one does perhaps drink ten pounds in a year is sufficient to overcome all the patriotism of an american End quote in noting however that the english feel but they do not see that is they are sensible of inconveniences when they are present but do not take sufficient care to prevent them he was too inherently fair-minded not to acknowledge the faults of the colonies as well and especially of those politicians who were striving to foment divisions Quote, i think the new yorkers have been very discreet in forbearing to write and publish against the late act of parliament he wrote to a friend in america i wish the boston people had been as quiet since governor bernard has sent over all their violent papers to the ministry and wrote them word that he daily expected a rebellion End quote. 
when the mob in boston destroyed the tea he grieved over a lawlessness which had united all parties in england against the american cause and though he was the agent for massachusetts he risked his position by honestly telling the leaders in that province that quote, i cannot but hope that the affair of the tea will have been considered in the assembly before this time and satisfaction proposed if not made for such a step will remove much of the prejudice now entertained against us and put us again on a fair footing in contending for our old privileges as occasion may require End quote when his advice was disregarded he complained and so we shall go on injuring and provoking each other instead of cultivating that good will and harmony so necessary to the general welfare End quote. again and again he begged the extremists in massachusetts not to excite the people for all the ends desired could be gained by peaceful methods far more certainly than by law-breaking and violence Quote, in the meantime i must hope that great care will be taken to keep our people quiet he advised since nothing is more wished for by our enemies than by insurrections we should give a good pretense for increasing the military among us and putting us under more severe restraints End quote. his fear he declared was that imprudencies on both sides may step by step bring on the most mischievous consequences it is imagined here that this act will enforce immediate compliance and if the people should be quiet content themselves with the laws they have and let the matter rest till in some future war the king wanting aids from them and finding himself restrained in his legislation by the act as much as the people shall think fit by his ministers to propose the repeal the parliament will be greatly disappointed and perhaps it may take this turn i wish nothing worse may happen End quote but if the people could be kept quiet for a time franklin held the outcome could not be doubtful it must be evident he affirmed that by our rapidly increasing strength we shall soon become of so much importance that none of our just claims of privilege will be as heretofore unattended to nor any security we can wish for our rights be denied us so he counselled even a submission to the parliamentary encroachments certain that their period must be brief the colonies are rapidly increasing in wealth and numbers he pointed out in the last war they maintained an army of twenty five thousand a country able to do that is no contemptible ally in another war they may perhaps do twice as much with equal ease whenever a war happens our aid will be wished for our friendship desired and cultivated our good will courted then is the time to say redress our grievances you take money from us by force and now you ask it of voluntary grant you cannot have it both ways if you choose to have it without our consent you must go on taking it in that way and be content with what little you can so obtain if you would have our free gifts desist from your compulsive methods and acknowledge our rights and secure our future enjoyment of them our claims will then be attended to and our complaints regarded End quote however much he might counsel moderate opposition and even temporary submission he did so because he believed it the most certain way of obtaining justice from great britain and not because he thought her conduct either prudent or justifiable long before the attempt to tax the colonies and so far as known before any other american had protested against such a course he claimed that quote, it is supposed to be an undoubted right of englishmen not to be taxed but by their own consent given through their representatives End quote. his opposition to parliamentary taxation began with the earliest attempt to a friend he wrote depend upon it my good neighbor i took every step in my power to prevent the passing of the stamp act nobody could be more concerned and interested than myself to oppose it sincerely and heartily but the tide was too strong against us the nation was provoked by american claims of independence and all parties joined in resolving by this act to settle the point we might as well have hindered the sun's setting that we could not do but since it is down my friend and it may be long before it rises again let us make as good a night of it as we can End quote. when contrary to his expectation the colonies refused to allow the act to be enforced and a movement to repeal the act began he told another quote, 
you guessed aright in supposing that i would not be a mute in that play i was extremely busy attending members of both houses informing explaining consulting disputing in a continual hurry from morning till night till the affair was happily ended during the course of it being called before the house of commons i spoke my mind pretty freely enclosed i sent you the imperfect account that was taken of that examination End quote. how strongly he felt the rights of his native land was shown by something else he wrote at this time in which he asserted that quote, i can only judge of others by myself i have some little property in america i will freely spend nineteen shillings in the pound to defend the right of giving or refusing the other shilling and after all if i cannot defend that right i can retire cheerfully with my little family into the boundless woods of america which are sure to afford freedom and subsistence to any man who can bait a hook or pull a trigger while other pleaders of the american cause were striving to explain previous acquiescences in parliamentary legislation he saw the futility of such attempts and took up the one consistent position Quote, the more i have thought and read on the subject the more i find myself confirmed in opinion that no middle doctrine can be well maintained i mean not clearly with intelligible arguments something might be made of either of the extremes that parliament has a power to make all laws for us or that it has a power to make no laws for us and i think the arguments for the latter more numerous and weighty than those of the former this doctrine was so in advance of what even the most extreme partisans of american rights thought of asserting that franklin never advocated it publicly on the contrary he was prepared to accept any compromise which would satisfy the two countries his purpose being to bring about a return of good feeling undoubtedly this desire to keep the middle ground was partly induced by his dual office holding for in these years in which he laboured so unceasingly to prevent separation he held the royal office of joint deputy postmaster general from the crown and several agencies from the colonies and franklin loved public office too well to wish to risk the loss of either so strong in fact was the itch that upon it being hinted to him that he might be given a better crown position than that he held he did everything in his power to gain the favour of those in office a vague message from the duke of grafton suggesting this as a possibility was sufficient to make franklin assure the go-between to use his own words Quote, i was extremely sensible of the duke's goodness and very thankful for his favourable disposition towards me that having lived long in england and contracted a friendship and affection for many persons here it could not but be agreeable to me to remain among them some time longer if not for the rest of my life and that there was no nobleman to whom i could from sincere respect for his great abilities and amiable qualities so cordially attach myself or to whom i should so willingly be obliged for the provision he mentioned as to the duke of grafton if his grace should think i could in any station where he might place me be serviceable to him and to the public End quote as if this was not a sufficient forgetting of his own aphorism that a ploughman on his legs is higher than a gentleman on his knees for some weeks he left no stone unturned to cultivate the ministry acting on advice quote, i accordingly called at the duke's and left my card and when i went next to the treasury his grace not being there mr cooper carried me to lord north chancellor of the exchequer who said very obligingly after talking of some american affairs i am told by mr cooper that you are not unwilling to stay with us i hope we shall find some way of making it worth your while i thanked his lordship and said i should stay with pleasure if i could anyways be useful to government he made me a compliment and i took my leave the thursday following i received another note from mr cooper directing me to be at the duke of grafton's next morning whose porter had orders to let me in i went accordingly and was immediately admitted but his grace being then engaged in some unexpected business with much condescension and politeness made that an apology for his not discoursing with me then but wished me to be at the treasury at twelve the next tuesday i went accordingly when mr cooper told me something had called the duke into the country and the board was put off 
which was not known till it was too late to send me word but he was glad i was come as he might then fix another day for me to go again with him into the country he assures me the duke has it at heart to do something for me End quote. all the office seekers complaisance however proved but a waste of time Quote, instead of me being appointed to a new office he had to tell his son there has been a motion made to deprive me of that i now hold and i believe for the same reason though that was not the reason given out viz my being too much of an american End quote. once assured that he was to receive no new appointment there was an amusing change in his attitude i am now grown too old to be ambitious of such a station as that which you say has been mentioned he wrote repose is more fit for me and much more suitable to my wishes there is no danger of such a thing being offered to me and i am sure i shall never ask it but even if it were offered i certainly could not accept it to act under such instructions as i know must be given with it whether love of country or love of office was the governing motive for his endeavors to maintain or restore concord he narrowly escaped the usual fate of the go-between because he counseled acquiescence in the stamp act and had a friend nominated to a stamped commissionership he was deemed in america to be little better than a traitor and popular anger against him was so fanned by his political opponents that there was danger for a time of a mob taking vengeance on his family and property fortunately for franklin he was summoned before parliament and questioned at the time that body was considering the repeal of the stamp act and he published this examination in a pamphlet which proved remarkably popular quieted the furor against him and once more brought him into favor despite this self-vindication as he continued to counsel moderate measures franklin was from this time mistrusted by such whigs as james otis samuel adams john dickinson r h lee and other extremists and they did not consider him as belonging to their party yet this did not gain him favor with the government party in great britain and after years of labor he could only describe his position as follows Quote, being born and bred in one of the countries and having lived long and made many agreeable connections of friendship in the other i wish all prosperity to both but i have talked and written so much and so long on the subject that my acquaintance are weary of hearing and the public of reading any more of it which begins to make me weary of talking and writing especially as i do not find that i have gained any point in either country except that of rendering myself suspected by my impartiality in england of being too much an american and in america of being too much an englishman End quote it was in seventeen seventy four that the maintenance of this mediatorial position was made impossible to him by a famous sequence of events complaining to a gentleman of character and distinction of the sending of troops to boston and the other repressive measures franklin was assured that none of them originated with the ministry but were solicited and obtained by some of the most respectable of the americans themselves as necessary measures for the welfare of that country upon franklin doubting his statement quote, he called on me some days after and produced to me letters from lieutenant governor hutchinson secretary oliver and others recommending the sending of troops and men of war and advising that in the colonies there must be an abridgment of what are called english liberties though astonished i could not but confess myself convinced End quote with these in his possession the colony agent believed it possible to bring about a reconciliation and he begged permission to let his countrymen know of their existence for he honestly believed that this would end the ill-feeling against great britain and place it instead upon the shoulders of the letter writers in this judgment he was entirely correct for he was shortly able to write the colonial secretary that quote, a sincere disposition prevails in the people there to be on good terms with the mother country and it is said that having immediately discovered as they think the authors of their grievances to be some of their own people their resentment against britain is thence much abated End quote. 
unfortunately for the hope of the colony agent the british ministry which for years had been vacillating in the policy to be pursued as regards america was at that moment in one of its numerous periods of reaction and with a folly which to-day seems unbelievable instead of availing itself of this opportunity it sought to use it as a means of destroying the one american who had consistently striven to heal the breach upon a hearing before the privy council of a petition for massachusetts bay for the removal from office of the writers of these criminatory letters instead of dealing with the petition the solicitor-general alexander wedderburn launched into a savage personal attack upon franklin whom he charged with having obtained the letters by fraud if not by theft i hope my lords he said you will mark and brand the man for the honor of this country of europe and of mankind private correspondence has hitherto been held sacred in times of the greatest party rage not only in politics but in religion he has forfeited all the respect of societies and of men into what companies will he hereafter go with an unembarrassed face or the honest intrepidity of virtue men will watch him with a jealous eye they will hide their papers from him and lock up their escritoires he will henceforth esteem it a liable to be called a man of letters homo truum that is fur or thief literarum then after reassuring the sacredness of a private correspondence he continued this property is as sacred and as precious to gentlemen of integrity as their family plate or jewels are and no man who knows the whatleys will doubt but that they would much sooner have chosen that any person should have taken their plate and sent it to holland for his avarice than that he should have secreted the letters of their friends their brother's friend and their father's friend and sent them away to boston to gratify an enemy's malice a foreign ambassador when residing here just before the breaking out of a war and upon particular occasions may bribe a villain to steal or betray any state papers he is under the command of another state and is not amenable to the laws of the country where he resides and the secure exemption from punishment may induce a laxer morality but mr franklin whatever he may teach the people at boston while he is here at least is a subject End of chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 11, part 3 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 11, Politician and Diplomat, part 3 there has been much discussion as to whether franklin acted honorably in transmitting these letters which might have been saved had his own simple statement been properly weighed the letters were shown him by a personal friend a member of parliament whom quote, i am not at present permitted to name end quote, but who franklin asserts was a gentleman of character and distinction this colony agent deeming it quote, my duty to give my constituents intelligence of such importance to their affairs end quote, finally won from this friend the privilege of sending the letters to the massachusetts leaders it is clear therefore that he had no reason to believe that they had been wrongfully obtained or that his friend had not the right to allow him to transmit them on the contrary franklin declared that he came by them honorably if blame there is it must rest on this still unknown man and franklin bearing all the vituperation which was heaped upon him was but sacrificing himself to shield another the probabilities favor the view that this was william straham whose position as printer to the king made it necessary that his share should remain unknown wedderburn's attack was with the facts at his disposal wholly unjustifiable and would have been without weight but for the circumstances which produced it for his speech was in truth but the expression franklin says of a court clamor raised against me as an incendiary and the decrying and the vilifying of the people of that country and me as their agent among the rest was quite a court measure his assertions are proved by the conduct of the privy council for without even a pretense of judging the cause before them during wedderburn's speech quote, all the members of the council the president himself lord gower not excepted frequently left outright another eye-witness states that 
he made them so far forget themselves and the character in which they officiated as to cry out hear him hear him end quote. and franklin speaks of their frequently breaking into applause one of the ablest lawyers of the period and one fitted to hold the scales impartially in his account of the trial said quote, i had the grievous mortifications to hear mr wedderburn wandering from the proper question before their lordships pour forth such a torrent of virulent abuse on dr franklin as never before took place within the compass of my knowledge of judicial proceedings his reproaches appearing to me incompatible with the principles of law truth justice propriety and humanity end quote franklin took this attack calmly but none the less it stung him deeply however bitterly he felt personally he still though further injured by being deprived of his office of joint deputy postmaster-general strove to bring about some agreement i long labored in england he asserted later with great zeal and sincerity to prevent the breach that has happened and which is now so wide that no endeavors of mine can possibly heal it you know the treatment i met with from that imprudent court but i keep a separate account of private injuries which i may forgive and i do not think it right to mix them with public affairs End quote. with lord chatham who sent for him he discussed the possibility of reconciling the two countries and was present by his invitation when the earl made his motion in the house of lords for the withdrawal of the troops from boston and again when he submitted a plan of conciliation indeed franklin was charged in the ensuing debate with being the author of it nor did he limit his efforts to those in opposition but brought into relation with lord howe the chosen instrument of the ministry already ashamed of the treatment accorded him by the earl's sister mrs howe with whom he played at chess he did his utmost to reach some common ground of agreement howe promised to grant franklin if he would but secure the pacification of the colonies any reward in the power of the government to bestow a promise which franklin said was to him what the french vulgarly called spitting in the soup but not taking offence he agreed that if lord howe received the appointment of commissioner to america and the propositions to that country were such as met his approval he would gladly go as his secretary he even guaranteed quote, without any instruction to warrant my so doing or assurance that i should be reimbursed or my conduct approved end quote, that the tea should be paid for if the colonies were but granted justice quote, an engagement in which i must have risked my whole fortune end quote. all these negotiations came to nothing however and when at last convinced that it was but a waste of time he took ship for america the abuse and persecution the ministry had heaped upon franklin had not merely restored his former popularity in america but had enormously added to it he was quickly elected to the continental congress to the pennsylvania assembly and to the pennsylvania convention congress appointed him postmaster-general and a member of many important committees pennsylvania made him chairman of the committee of safety which was practically the governorship of the colony and the convention chose him for their president my time he wrote a friend was never more fully employed in the morning at six i am at the committee of safety appointed by the assembly to put the province in a state of defense which committee holds till near nine when i am at the congress and that sits till four in the afternoon how franklin avoided so far as possible any share in the drafting of the public papers of the congress has been told already nor was he more forward in debate it was poor richard who remarked quote, here comes the orator with his flood of words and his drop of reason End quote. and during his whole life franklin was no speechmaker i served jefferson said with general washington in the legislature of virginia before the revolution and during it with dr franklin in congress i never heard either of them speak ten minutes at a time nor to any but the main point which was to decide the question they laid their shoulders to the great points knowing that the little ones would follow of themselves End quote franklin himself bears this out by saying that quote, i was but a bad speaker never eloquent subject to much hesitation in my choice of words hardly correct in language and yet i generally carried my points 
john adams in one of his periodic outbursts against the man whom the public deemed greater than himself contrasted his own services in congress in which he claimed to have been quote, active and alert in every branch of business both in the house and on committees constantly proposing measures supporting those i approved when moved by others opposing such as i disapproved discussing and arguing on every question end quote. with those of franklin who was seen adam says from day to day sitting in silence a great part of the time fast asleep in his chair end quote yet franklin was appointed on every important committee and adams on few and the sage could he but have read his brother congressman's comparison might fairly have retorted with the wisdom of poor richard quote, he that speaks much is much mistaken or the worst wheel of the cart makes the most noise End quote. however little franklin may have seemed to have accomplished to those who elected to think so one service he attempted is not to be passed over as he had been among the first to suggest a union of the colonies under great britain so he was foremost in advocating their immediate union in their contest with the mother country and long before the majority of congress saw the wisdom of the purpose or were even willing to consider it he drafted and laid before that body his articles of confederation the first true step toward a national union in the politics of pennsylvania too he wielded a most dominating influence for it was chiefly through his exertions that the old penn charter was abrogated and a new republican constitution obtained in its stead in the effecting of this change too he succeeded in finally crushing the propriety or aristocratic party which had fought him with such bitterness for over twenty years so that never again did it recover its influence in the state a blow the leading families never forgave and the resentment of which expresses itself socially even to this day in philadelphia vital as were his labors in local politics in the congress in canada at cambridge and at staten island he was more needed and in fact seems to have been preordained by nature and training for another service once the war from being an attempt to wrest rights from an acknowledged sovereign became a conflict to maintain independence the new formed country turned for assistance to france then the great enemy of britain almost alone of the congressmen franklin had traveled in that country and had both friends and repute there even more important however was the fact that already semi approaches had been made to him by those in authority years before when the excitement over the new doctrine of colonial taxation was sounding a warning which the british people would not hear there were others quick to heed the murmur of discontent and complaint and to recognize in it a means for injuring their foe as they had never yet been able to do but if the times were ripening the colony agent was not yet ready to part with old lamps for new ones du Guerchy, the french ambassador is gone home franklin relates and monsieur durand is left minister plenipotentiary he is extremely curious to inform himself in the affairs of america pretends to have a great esteem for me on account of the abilities shown in my examination has desired to have all my political writings invited me to dine with him was very inquisitive treated me with great civility makes me visits and etc i fancy that intriguing nation would like very well to meddle on occasion and blow up the coals between britain and her colonies but i hope we shall give them no opportunity End quote. not quite ten years after this was written franklin was sailing across the atlantic one of three commissioners sent to beg the aid of france and to an english friend who chided him for disloyalty franklin replied i was fond to a folly of our british connections and it was with infinite regret that i saw the necessity you would force us into of breaking it but the extreme cruelty with which we have been treated has now extinguished every thought of returning to it and separated us for ever you have thereby lost limbs that will never grow again End quote it has been said of franklin by the historian of american diplomacy that he must be considered the one true diplomat america has ever produced and when his services and the circumstances under which they were rendered are weighed the statement seems justifiable almost from the moment of his arrival in paris he came to exercise an influence with the french ministry which can hardly be exaggerated 
the reiterated charge of his enemies was that he was the tool of france and always acted in her interests but his successor in office jefferson who was of all men the best fitted to know the truth of this asserted quote, as to the charge of subservience to france two years of my own service with him at paris daily visits and the most friendly and confidential conversation convinced me that it had not a shadow of foundation he possessed the confidence of that government in the highest degree insomuch that it may truly be said that they were more under his influence than he under theirs the fact is that his temper was so amiable and conciliatory his conduct so rational never urging impossibilities or even things unreasonably inconvenient to them in short so moderate and attentive to their difficulties as well as our own that what his enemies called subservience i saw was only that reasonable disposition which sensible that advantages are not all to be on one's own side yielding what is just and liberal is the more certain of obtaining liberality and justice mutual confidence produces of course mutual influence and this was all which subsisted between dr franklin and the government of france End quote this individual opinion all the documentary evidence goes to reinforce and it is impossible in studying it not to conclude that the opposition to and attacks upon franklin by his own countrymen were due primarily to the dislike and jealousy of his fellow commissioners lee and adams who unable to compete with him in france were driven to raise a cabal against him in america composed of almost the identical elements which endeavored to bring about the removal of washington from the command of the armies and which successfully wrought the political ruin of john dickinson and robert morris dr franklin jefferson long after said had many political enemies as every character must which with decision enough to have opinions has energy and talent to give them effect on the feelings of the adversary opinion these enmities were chiefly in pennsylvania and massachusetts in the former they were merely of the proprietary party in the latter they did not commence till the revolution and then sprung chiefly from personal animosities which spreading by little and little became at length of some extent dr lee was his principal calumniator a man of much malignity who besides enlisting his whole family in the same hostility was enabled as the agent of massachusetts with the british government to infuse it into that state with considerable effect mr izard the doctor's enemy also but from a pecuniary transaction never countenanced these charges against him mr jay silas dean mr lawrence his colleagues also ever maintained toward him unlimited confidence and respect End quote. strangely enough franklin was saved from his countrymen by the intervention of france very early in the mission the ministry of that country deliberately took the step of ignoring franklin's fellow commissioners and again and again in granting aids stipulated to him that lee and adams should know nothing and so franklin was forced repeatedly in writing to congress to tell them that quote, the other commissioners are not acquainted with this proposition as yet i being expressly enjoined not to communicate it to any other person not even to the other gentlemen End quote it was not strange under these circumstances that his fellow commissioners united in abusing him lee complained that quote, if dr franklin's jealousy and intolerant spirit together with the artifices successively employed had not incapacitated the other from serving their country and the common cause by their advice and information End quote. many imaginary ills would not have come to pass and adams asserted that virginies made franklin his confidant only because he could manage him as he pleased their fellow commissioner took all their abuse and plotting calmly and one anecdote will serve to show how little it moved him quote, mr z adams while at paris had often pressed the doctor to communicate with him his several negotiations with the court of france which the doctor avoided as decently as he could at length he received from mr z adams a very intemperate letter he folded it up and put it into a pigeon-hole the second third and so forth on to the fifth or sixth he received and disposed of in the same way 
finding no answer could be obtained by letter mr z adams paid him a personal visit and gave a loose to all the warmth of which he was susceptible the doctor replied i can no more answer this conversation than the several impatient letters you have written me taking them down from the pigeon-hole call on me when you are cool and good-humoured and i will justify myself to you dr lee's accusation of captain landis for insanity wrote franklin was probably well founded as in my opinion would have been the same accusation if it had been brought by landis against lee for though neither of them are permanently mad they are both so at times and the insanity of the latter is the most mischievous of adams franklin said the extravagant and violent language held here by a public person in public company which have a tendency to diminish the union with france are here and i hope there in america imputed to the true cause a disorder in the brain which though not constant has its fits too frequent whether it was jealousy or insanity the time came when practically the public business had come to a standstill and convinced of this franklin offered to resign but the french government interfered and through their american envoy secured the recall of franklin's rivals and the election of franklin as the sole minister to france the congress have done me the honor franklin said to refuse accepting my resignation and insist on my continuing in their service till the peace i must therefore buckle again to business and thank god that my health and spirits are of late improved i fancy it may have been a double mortification to those enemies you have mentioned to me that i should ask as a favor what they hoped to vex me by taking from me and that i should nevertheless be continued but this sort of consideration should never influence our conduct we ought always to do what appears best to be done without much regarding what others may think of it i call this continuance as honor and i really esteem it to be a greater than my first appointment when i consider that all the interest of my enemies united with my own request were not sufficient to prevent it an interesting feature of these years of negotiation were the indirect overtures made franklin by the british ministry though george the third was convinced that hatred of this country is the constant object of franklin's mind he yet thought it proper to keep open the channel of intercourse with that insidious man and through david hartley and other informal agents he endeavored to negotiate an arrangement which should regain at least a nominal sovereignty over the colonies and by ending the war with them enable england to avenge the faithless and insolent conduct of france but franklin held that the true political interest of america consists in observing and fulfilling with the greatest exactitude the engagements of our alliance with france and behaving at the same time towards england so as not entirely to extinguish her hopes of a reconciliation and so he refused to play false to an ally or consider reunion with great britain on any terms you may please yourselves and your children he told one of these negotiators with the rattle of your right to govern us as long as you have done with that of your king's being king of france without giving us the least concern if you do not attempt to exercise it that this pretended right is indisputable as you say we utterly deny your parliament never had a right to govern us and your king has forfeited it by his bloody tyranny the english seem not to know either how to continue the war or to make peace with us he told washington even after yorktown but finally a treaty was concluded and his work done he returned homeward writing to the englishman who had striven most for peace the following farewell i cannot quit the coasts of europe without taking leave of my ever dear friend mr hartley we were long fellow laborers in the best of all works the work of peace i leave you still in the field but having finished my day's task i am going home to go to bed wish me a good night's rest as i do you a pleasant evening this hope for a rest was but elusive no sooner had he landed at philadelphia than the two parties in the assembly and council the constitutionists and the anti-constitutionists joined in requesting my service as counsellor and afterward in electing me as president 
of seventy-four members in council and assembly who voted by ballot there was in my first election but one negative besides my own i had on my return some right he acknowledged to a friend to expect repose and it was my intention to avoid all public business but i had not firmness enough to resist the unanimous desire of my country folks and i find myself harnessed again in their service for another year they engrossed the prime of my life they have eaten my flesh and seem resolved now to pick my bones it is poetically appropriate that his last public service was performed in the federal convention and that no man in that body contributed more to bring about the lasting union of the states of which he had been among the earliest suggestors and for which he had worked so unceasingly his closing remarks whilst the last members were signing form a fitting end to his own career dr franklin looking toward the president's chair at the back of which a rising sun happened to be painted observed to a few members near him that painters had found it difficult to distinguish in their art the rising from the setting sun i have he said often and often in the course of the session and the vicissitudes of my hopes and fears as to its issue looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting but now at length i have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun End quote. End of chapter eleven franklin as politician and diplomat chapter twelve part one of the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter twelve social life part one the busy man quoth poor richard has few idle visitors to the boiling pot the flies come not End quote but this was only one of his many aphorisms which he himself disproved for however manifold his occupations there never seems to have been the time when he had not friends and the time to see them with his first arrival in philadelphia he relates that i began now to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town that were lovers of reading with whom i spent my evenings very pleasantly End quote so in london during his short sojourn there he went to the taverns and made friends of the ingenious frequenters in his voyage back to philadelphia too an incident served to show his social inclinations a passenger was detected marking a pack of cards was tried for it by his fellow voyagers and being convicted he was condemned to pay a fine and upon his refusal was excommunicated by the mess every one refusing to play eat drink or converse with him the embryo philosopher of twenty thereupon noted in his journal that quote, man is a sociable being and it is for aught i know one of the worst of punishments to be excluded from society i have read abundance of fine things on the subject of solitude and i know it is a common boast in the mouths of those that affect to be thought wise that they are never less alone than when alone i acknowledge solitude an agreeable refreshment to a busy mind but were these thinking people obliged to be always alone i am apt to think they would quickly find their very being insupportable to them End quote once established in philadelphia as already told he founded the social club of the junto for this little society franklin ever retained the warmest feelings many years after its beginning he wrote from england to a fellow member quote, i wish you would continue to meet the junto notwithstanding that some effects of our public political misunderstandings may sometimes appear there it is now perhaps one of the oldest clubs as i think it was formerly one of the best in the king's dominions it wants but about two years of forty since it was established End quote still later when in france he said you tell me you sometimes visit the ancient junto i wish you would do it oftener i know they all love and respect you and regret your absenting yourself so much people are apt to grow strange and not understand one another so well when they meet but seldom since we have held that club till we are grown gray together let us hold it out to the end for my own part i find i love company chat 
a laugh a glass and even a song as well as ever and at the same time relish better than i used to do the grave observations and wise sentences of old men's conversation so that i am sure the gento will still be as agreeable to me as it ever has been i therefore hope it will not be discontinued as long as we are able to crawl together End quote in his most active period franklin states in his autobiography quote, our club the junto was found so useful and afforded such satisfaction to the members that several were desirous of introducing their friends which could not well be done without exceeding what we had settled as a convenient number viz twelve we had from the beginning made it a rule to keep our institution a secret which was pretty well observed the intention was to avoid applications of improper persons for admittance some of whom perhaps we might find it difficult to refuse i was one of those who were against any addition to our number but instead of it made in writing a proposal that every member separately should endeavour to form a subordinate club with the same rules respecting queries etc and without informing them of the connection with the junto the advantages proposed were the improvement of so many more young citizens by the use of our institutions our better acquaintance with the general sentiments of the inhabitants on any occasion as the junto member might propose what queries we should desire and was to report to the junto what passed in his separate club the promotion of our particular interests in business by more extensive recommendation and the increase of our influence in public affairs and our power of doing good by spreading through the several clubs the sentiments of the junto the project was approved and every member undertook to form his club but they did not all succeed five or six only were completed which were called by different names as the vine the union the band etc they were useful to themselves and afforded us a good deal of amusement information and instruction besides answering in some considerable degree our views of influencing the public opinion on particular occasions of which i shall give some instances in course of time as they happened End quote another expression of his social impulses in these years is shown by his being one of the organizers of the first masonic society in america in seventeen thirty in seventeen thirty two he was appointed a warden and in seventeen thirty four he was elected grand master on which occasion quote, a very elegant entertainment was provided and the proprietor the governor and several other persons of distinction honored the society with their presence End quote how by his exhibitions of electrical phenomena franklin's house was continually full for some time with people who came to see these new wonders has already been mentioned and there were other social incidents one of which he described as follows quote, it is proposed to put an end to our experiments for this season somewhat humorously in a party of pleasure on the banks of the schuylkill spirits at the same time are to be fired by a spark sent from side to side through the river without any other conductor than the water an experiment which we some time since performed to the amazement of many a turkey is to be killed for our dinner by electric shock and roasted by the electric jack before a fire kindled by the electrified bottle when the healths of all the famous electricians in england holland france and germany are to be drank in electrified bumpers under the discharge of guns from the electrical battery End quote his share in the association the hospital the academy and many other public spirited affairs brought him into relation with all the prominent folk and he was socially received by the best as already told from these invitations his wife was omitted and as franklin for some years dwelt over his shop and later removed to a more quiet part of town at the corner of sassafras and second streets where he lived as to the appearance in modest circumstances there was no attempt to return the civilities in kind yet there was a welcome and a homely meal and room for all who chose to come mr francis spent the last evening with me franklin told the future president of king's college and we were all glad to hear that you seriously meditate a visit after the middle of next month and that you will inform us by a line when to expect you we drank your health and mrs johnson's remembering your kind entertainment of us in stratford End quote. 
there are numerous such casual allusions to visitors in his letters and always in a way to show that they were boons to the host whenever franklin travelled as his concern in the post office often necessitated he was the object of the warmest hospitality of one visit to the northern states he said quote, i left new england slowly and with great reluctance short days journeys and loitering visits on the road for three or four weeks manifested my unwillingness to quit a country in which i drew my first breath spent my earliest and most pleasant days and had now received so many fresh marks of the people's goodness and benevolence in the kind and affectionate treatment i had everywhere met with i almost forgot i had a home till i was more than half way towards it till i had one by one parted with all my new england friends and was got into the western borders of connecticut among mere strangers another letter gives a glimpse of social hours in new jersey and new york quote, the corporation were to have a dinner that day at the point for their entertainment and prevailed on us to stay they were all the principal people and a great many ladies after dinner we set out and got here before dark we waited on the governor and on general amherst yesterday dined with lord sterling went in the evening to my old friend mr kennedy's funeral and are to dine with the general to-day with the outbreak of the bitter political contests over the proprietary government the court party pronounced an edict of social ostracism against him and henceforth he was tabooed at such houses as the allens shippens norrises and other aristocratic families one enemy declared that his friends had generally deserted him but on his return from his first mission to england franklin indignantly denied this writing quote, dr smith's report of the diminution of my friends were all false my house has been full of a succession of them from morning to night ever since my arrival congratulating me on my return with the utmost cordiality and affection my fellow-citizens while i was on the sea had at the annual election chosen me unanimously as they had done every year while i was in england to be their representative in assembly and would they say if i had not disappointed them by coming privately to town before they heard of my landing have met me with five hundred horse End quote there can be no question that this regard was reciprocated from europe he wrote on one occasion quote, i thank you for the pleasing account you give me of the health and welfare of my old friends hugh roberts luke morris philip singh samuel rhodes etc with the same of yourself and family shake the old ones by the hand for me and give the young ones my blessing on receiving word of the death of one he replied quote, i regret the loss of my friend parsons death begins to make breaches in the little junto of old friends that he had long forborne and it must be expected he will now soon pick us all off one after another End quote. when yet another break in his circle came he was quote, grieved to hear of the death of my good old friend dr evans i have lost so many since i left america that i begin to fear that i shall find myself a stranger among strangers when i return if so i must come again to my friends in england End quote. so he found cause for regret in the separation that his long agencies in great britain forced upon him but this exile though an honourable one he told a new england friend is become grievous to me in so long a separation from my family friends and country all which you happily enjoy and long may you continue to enjoy them i hope for the great pleasure of once more seeing and conversing with you and though living on in one's children as we both may do it is a good thing i cannot but fancy it might be better to continue living ourselves at the same time i rejoice therefore in your kind attentions of including me in the benefits of that inestimable stone which curing all diseases even old age itself will enable us to see the future glorious state of our america enjoying in full security her own liberties and offering in her bosom a participation of them to all the oppressed of the nations i anticipate the jolly conversations we and twenty more of our friends may have a hundred years hence on this subject over that well replenished bowl at cambridge commencement End quote. 
once in england although he lived simply in lodgings he formed a wide and steadily growing circle of friends in his account of his agency to the pennsylvania assembly he informed that body that quote, i made journeys partly for the health and partly that i might by country visits to persons of influence have more convenient opportunities of discoursing with them on our public affairs the expense of which journeys was not easily proportioned and separated and being myself honored with visits from persons of quality and distinction i was obliged for the credit of the province to live in a fashion and expense suitable to the public character i sustained and much above what i should have done if i had been considered merely as a private person and this difference of expense was not easy to distinguish and charge in my accounts i have lately made a journey of a fortnight to birmingham sheffield leeds and manchester he told a correspondent and returned only in time to be at court on the king's birthday which was yesterday so visits were made to bath and other english resorts two trips to cambridge with his son he described as follows quote, we stayed there a week being entertained with great kindness by the principal people and shown all the curiosities of the place and returning by another road to see more of the country we came again to london i found the journey advantageous to my health increasing both my health and spirits and therefore as all the great folks were out of town and public business at a stand i the more easily prevailed with myself to take another journey and accept the invitation we had to be again at cambridge at the commencement the beginning of july we went accordingly and were present at all the ceremonies dined every day in their halls and my vanity was not a little gratified by the particular regard shown me by the chancellor and vice-chancellor of the university and the heads of colleges even more enthusiastically he wrote to lord kames of an excursion with his son into scotland quote, our conversation till we came to york was chiefly a recollection of what we had seen and heard the pleasures we had enjoyed and the kindnesses we had received in scotland and how far that country had exceeded our expectations on the whole i must say i think the time we spent there was six weeks of the densest happiness i have met with in any part of my life and the agreeable and instructive society that we found there in such plenty has left so pleasing an impression on my memory that did not strong connections draw me elsewhere i believe scotland would be the country i should choose to spend the remainder of my days in End quote. his one grief so he told his lordship was that i did not press you and lady kames more strongly to favour us with your company farther how much more agreeable would our journey have been if we could have enjoyed you as far as york we could have beguiled the way by discoursing on a thousand things that now we may never have an opportunity of considering together for conversation warms the mind enlivens the imagination and is continually starting fresh game that is immediately pursued and taken and which would never have occurred in the duller intercourse of epistolary correspondence so that whenever i reflect on the great pleasure and advantage i receive from the free communication of sentiment in the conversation we had at kames and in the agreeable little rides to the tweed side i shall for ever regret our premature parting End quote clearly the liking was reciprocal for not long after he again wrote to kames quote, your invitation to make another jaunt to scotland and offer to meet us half-way en famille was extremely obliging certainly i never spent my time anywhere more agreeably nor have i been in any place where the inhabitants and their conversation left such lastingly pleasing impressions on my mind accompanied with the strongest inclination once more to visit that hospitable friendly and sensible people the friendship your lordship in particular honours me with would not you may be assured be among the least of my inducements he was as good as his word in this for once again he journeyed northward a pilgrimage he described to his son as follows quote, in scotland i spent five days with lord kames at his seat blair drummond near stirling two or three days at glasgow two days at caron ironworks and the rest of the month in and about edinburgh lodging at david hume's who entertained me with the greatest kindness and hospitality as did lord kames and his lady 
all our old acquaintances there sir alexander dick and lady mr mcgowan doctors robertson cullen black ferguson russell and others inquired affectionately of your welfare i was out three months End quote. Another friend he was fond of visiting was Lord Le Despenser, and on one if not more occasions he clearly forgot poor Richard's warning that fish and visitors smell in three days. For he told a correspondent that I spent sixteen days at Lord Le Despenser's most agreeably and returned in good health and spirits, elsewhere noting during another stay that i am in this house as much at my ease as if it were my own and the gardens are a paradise but a pleasanter thing is the kind countenance the facetious and very intelligent conversation of mine host who having been for many years engaged in public affairs seen all parts of europe and kept the best company in the world is himself the best existing End quote. Yet a third British home to which he always went with especial pleasure was Twyford, the residence of his warm friend Bishop Shipley. I now breathe with reluctance the smoky air of London, Franklin told him, when I think of the sweet air of Twyford, and by the time your races are over, or about the middle of next month, if it should not then be unsuitable to your engagements or other purposes, I promise myself the happiness of spending a week or two where I so pleasantly spent the last. End quote. And in France he wrote one of the Shipley girls, your mention of the summer-house brings fresh to my mind all the pleasures I enjoyed in the sweet retreat at Twyford, the hours of agreeable and instructive conversation with the amiable family at table, with its father alone, the delightful walks in the gardens and neighboring grounds. End quote. These were specimens of his true intimacies, but there was much social intercourse of a more formal nature. Even to catalogue his friends and visits would be a task of no little magnitude, but an extract from a semi-journal he wrote will best serve to give a slight idea of both and to show how his time was spent. Quote, Returning from Bright Helmstone, I was called to visit my friend Mr. Sargent at his seat, Halstead, in Kent, agreeable to a former engagement. He let me know that he had promised to conduct me to Lord Stanhope's at Chevening, who expected I would call on him when I came into that neighborhood. We accordingly waited on Lord Stanhope that evening, who told me that Lord Chatham desired to see me, and that Mr. Sargent's house, where I was to lodge, being in the way, he would call for me there the next morning, and carry me to Mr. Hayes. This was done accordingly. That truly great man received me with abundance of civility. From Hayes I went to Halstead, Mr. Sargent's place, to dine, intending thence to visit Lord Stanhope at Chevening, but hearing that his lordship and the family were in town, I stayed at Halstead all night, and the next morning went to Chislehurst to call on Lord Camden, it being in my way to town. I met his lordship and family in two carriages just without his gate, going on a visit of congratulation to Lord Chatham and his lady on the late marriage of their daughter to Lord Mahone, son of Lord Stanhope. They were to be back at dinner, so I agreed to go in, stay to dinner, and spend the evening there, and not return to town till next morning. End, quote. End of part one of chapter twelve. Chapter twelve, part two of the Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter twelve, Social Life, part two. It is not to be supposed that there were not enemies as well as friends in these years, and Franklin's social experience with one of these gives an amusing insight into his character and governing principles of conduct. For a number of years, the Earl of Hillsborough was Secretary of State for America, and there was a persistent, if veiled, war between him and the colony agent. Yet in Franklin's journal through Ireland, quote, being in dublin at the same time with his lordship i met with him accidentally at the lord lieutenant's who had happened to invite us to dine with a large company on the same day he was surprisingly civil and urged my fellow-travellers and me to call at his house in our intended journey northward where we might be sure of better accommodations than the inns would afford us 
he pressed us so politely that it was not easy to refuse without apparent rudeness as we must pass through his town hillsborough and by his door we called upon him and were detained at his house four days during which time he entertained us with great civility and a particular attention to me that appeared the more extraordinary as i knew that just before we left london he had expressed himself concerning me in very angry terms calling me a republican a factious mischievous fellow and the like he seemed attentive to everything that might make my stay in his house agreeable to me and put his eldest son lord kilwarling into his phaeton with me to drive me a round of forty miles that i might see the country the seats the manufactures covering me with his own great coat lest i should take cold all which i could not but wonder at when i had been a little while returned to london i waited on him to thank him for his civilities in ireland and to discourse with him on a georgia affair the porter told me he was not at home i left my card went another time and received the same answer though i knew he was at home a friend of mine being with him after intermissions of a week each i made two more visits and received the same answer the last time was on a levy day when a number of carriages were at his door my coachman driving up alighted and was opening the coach door when the porter seeing me came out and surlily chid the coachman for opening the door before he had inquired whether my lord was at home and then turning to me said my lord is not at home i have never since been nigh him and we have only abused one another at a distance End quote this affront franklin was presently able to revenge for he drew up a reply to a report of the secretary of so convincing a character that the ministry who desired but an excuse to oust hillsborough from the cabinet availed themselves of it to force his resignation yet though the earl knew of this and could never forgive me for writing that pamphlet he still masked his dislike Quote, i went down to oxford with and at the instance of lord le despenser franklin relates who is on all occasions very good to me and seems of late very desirous of my company that same day lord hillsborough called upon lord le despenser whose chamber and mine were together in queen's college i was in the inner room shifting and heard his voice but did not see him and he went downstairs immediately with lord le despenser who mentioned that i was above he returned directly and came to me in the pleasantest manner imaginable dr franklin said he i did not know till this minute that you were here and i am come back to make you my bow i am glad to see you at oxford and that you look so well etc in return for this extravagance i complimented him on his son's performance in the theatre though indeed it was but indifferent so that account was settled for as people say when they are angry if he strikes me i'll strike him again i think sometimes it may be right to say if he flatters me i'll flatter him again this is lex talionis returning offences in kind my quarrel is only with him who of all men i ever met with is surely the most unequal in his treatment of people the most insincere and the most wrong-headed the whole episode serves to illustrate two of poor richard's worldly wise remarks if any man flatters me i'll flatter him again though he were my best friend and he is not well bred that cannot bear ill breeding in others it also throws a flood of light on some advice the earl of shelburne later the marquis of landown gave the english negotiator of the treaty of seventeen eighty three some people in this country he warned him who have too long indulged themselves in abusing everything american have been pleased to circulate an opinion that dr franklin is a very cunning man in answer to which i have remarked to mr oswald dr franklin knows very well how to manage a cunning man but when the doctor converses or treats with a man of candor there is no man more candid than himself there was too in these years in england more or less intercourse with the diplomatic corps how the french ambassador sought him out has been elsewhere mentioned but this was but one instance 
several of the foreign ambassadors franklin remarked have assiduously cultivated my acquaintance treating me as one of their corps partly i believe from the desire they have from time to time of hearing something of american affairs an object become of importance in foreign courts who begin to hope britain's alarming power will be diminished by the defection of her colonies and partly that they may have an opportunity of introducing me to the gentlemen of their country who desire it the king too has lately been heard to speak of me with great regard still another element was club life not of the kind now termed such for institutions which have made it possible had not then come into existence it was then the mode for men to gather daily or weekly at some tavern and eat a dinner together the expense for food and wine being clubbed or shared when in france his letters to his friends in london often referred to a club he frequented while in england pleased to present my best respects to our good old friends of the london coffee-house he begged one correspondent i often figure to myself the pleasure i should have in being once more seated among them End quote. again he requested pleased to present my affectionate respects to that honest sensible and intelligent society who did me so long the honour of admitting me to share in their instructive conversations i never think of the hours i so happily spent in that company without regretting that they are never to be repeated i often think of the agreeable evenings i used to pass with that excellent collection of good men he told one of the members the club at the london and wish to be again among them perhaps i may pop in some thursday evening when they least expect me one letter he ended with a heartfelt wish to embrace you once more and enjoy your sweet society in peace among our honest worthy ingenious friends at the london nor was the regard one-sided for a member informed him that the honest whig club drank your health very affectionately in sailing away from great britain david hume assured franklin that quote, i am very sorry that you intend soon to leave our hemisphere america has sent us many good things gold silver sugar tobacco indigo etc but you are the first philosopher and indeed the first great man of letters for whom we are beholden to her it is our own fault that we have not kept him whence it appears that we do not agree with solomon that wisdom is above gold for we take care never to send back an ounce of the latter which we once lay our fingers upon the regret was quite as strong on that part of the voyager for in departing he declared that quote, i fancy i feel a little like dying saints who in parting with those they love in this world are only comforted with the hope of a more perfect happiness in the next i have in america connections of the most engaging kind and happy as i have been in the friendships here contracted those promise me greater and more lasting felicity upon the whole he said on another occasion i have lived so great a part of my life in britain and have formed so many friendships in it that i love it and sincerely wish it prosperity and therefore wish to see that union on which alone i think it can be secured and established End quote as in his circle of friends in philadelphia he outlived the most of his intimates in great britain and in his last years heard with grief of one more break Quote, the departure of my dearest friend which i learn from your last letter greatly affects me to meet her once more in this life was one of the principal motives of my proposing to visit england again before my return to america the last year carried off my friends dr pringle dr fothergill lord kames and lord le despenser this has begun to take away the rest and strikes the hardest thus the ties i had to that country and indeed to the world in general are loosened one by one and i shall soon have no attachment left to make me unwilling to follow End quote it was in france however that his greatest social success was achieved twice while in great britain as a colony agent he had made trips to paris and among the scientists there had made a wide circle of friends and been won by the charm of the people 
the civilities we everywhere receive he told an english friend give us the strongest impressions of the french politeness it seems to be a point settled here universally that strangers are to be treated with respect and one has just the same deference shown one here by being a stranger as in england by being a lady on his return to england he could not but look back on quote, the time i spent in paris and in the improving conversation and agreeable society of so many ingenious and learned men which seems now to me like a pleasing dream from which i was only to be awakened by finding myself at london would to god he exclaimed in speaking of his intended return to america i could take with me messieurs dupont dubourg and some other french friends with their good ladies i might then by mixing them with my friends in philadelphia form a little happy society that would prevent me ever wishing again to visit europe End quote nor was it only in the scientific circles that he made acquaintances and the fame of his electrical experiments even secured him an invitation to the french court you see he wrote miss stevenson i speak of the queen as if i had seen her and so i have for you must know i have been at court we went to versailles last sunday and had the honor of being presented to the king he spoke to both of us very graciously and very cheerfully he is a handsome man has a very lively look and appears younger than he is in the evening we were at the grand covert where the family sup in public the table was half a hollow square the service gold when either made a sign for drink the word was given by one of the waiters a boire pour le roi or a boire pour la reine then two persons came from within the one with wine and the other with water in carafes each drank a little glass of what he brought and then put both the carafes with a glass on a salver and then presented it their distance from each other was such as that other chairs might have been placed between any two of them an officer of the court brought us up through the crowd of spectators and placed sir john pringle so as to stand between the queen and madame victoire the king talked a good deal to sir john asked many questions about our royal family and did me too the honor of taking some notice of me that is saying enough End quote when franklin came to france therefore as a commissioner from the continental congress it was to a people not merely eager to espouse his country's cause but already somewhat acquainted with the man from the moment he landed and before it was even known what attitude the court would take toward him the lionizing began a welcoming ball was given him at nantes where he noted that quote, there were no women's headdresses less than five and a few were seven lengths of the face above the top of the forehead end quote. but as he journeyed toward paris he was persuaded to pause long enough to dine at the duc de rochefoucauld's where there were duchesses and a countess he remarked no head higher than a face and a half so it seems the farther from court the more extravagant the mode end quote this entertaining was forced upon him before the object of his mission was divulged but quote, i find it generally supposed here that i am sent to negotiate and that opinion appears to give great pleasure if i can judge by the extreme civilities i meet with from the numbers of the principal people who have done me the honor to visit me End quote once in paris although not openly recognized by the court in his diplomatic capacity every one united to show him honor and courtesy as already quoted he assured his sister that the account you have had of the vogue i am in here has some truth in it perhaps few strangers in france have had the good fortune to be so universally popular End quote. to his daughter he remarked the clay medallion of me you say you gave to mr hopkinson was the first of the kind made in france a variety of others have been made since of different sizes some to be set in the lids of snuff boxes and some so small as to be worn in rings and the numbers sold are incredible these with the pictures busts and prints of which copies upon copies are spread everywhere have made your father's face as well known as that of the moon so that he durst not do anything that would oblige him to run away as his fizz would discover him wherever he should venture to show it 
it is said by learned etymologists that the name doll for the images children play with is derived from the word idol from the number of dolls now made of him he may be truly said that in this sense to be idolized in this country End quote. figure me in your mind he asked a friend as jolly as formerly and as strong and hearty only a few years older very plainly dressed wearing my thin gray straight hair that peeps out under my only coiffure a fine fur cap which comes down my forehead almost to my spectacles think how this must appear among the powdered heads of paris yet it was in vain that the british ambassador sought to throw ridicule on the new envoy quote, i talk of him in a ludicrous manner and sometimes say for instance that the effect of his fur cap seems to be worn out and that i observe he is less talked of since the arrival of pacini the famous italian composer end quote. to his principal however he told another story quote, that physician de bourg whom your lordship has heard of sent cards all over paris testifying to his acquaintance the arrival of dr franklin i have already observed to your lordship that numbers of people resort to him franklin but there are very few persons of condition among them End quote. then as if to complete the stormount he acknowledged that from the first the duc de choiseul and his party took franklin by the hand and quote, openly espoused the cause of the rebels End quote. and that the newcomer had formed a great intimacy with the duc de chartres i live here in great respect franklin himself said to a friend and dine every day with great folks but i still long for home and for repose and should be happy to eat indian pudding in your company and under your hospitable roof when john adams for a time his fellow commissioner joined him in paris and lived with him he shared in this unending hospitality and recorded in his journal that quote, invitations were sent to dr franklin and me every day in the week to dine in some great or small company end quote. a complete chronicle of his social hours would be impossible but a glimpse here and there may well be taken from the diary of john adams are extracted the following to show some of the entertainments accepted by the two commissioners Quote, dr franklin presented to me the compliments of m turgot late controller of the finance and his invitation to dine with him went with dr franklin and mr lee and dined in company with the duchess d'anville the mother of the duc de la rochefoucauld and twenty of the great people of france dined with monsieur chalut one of the farmers general we were shown into the most superb gallery that i have yet seen the paintings statues and curiosities were innumerable the old marshal richelieu dined there and a vast number of other great company after dinner mr chalut invited dr franklin and me to go to the opera and take a seat in his logis we did the music and dancing were very fine dined at home with a great deal of company went after dinner to see the misanthrope of moliere with mr emile it was followed by the arrosement dined at mr bertin's the secretary of state at his seat in the country dr franklin his grandson and i rode with madame bertin the niece of the minister in her voiture with four horses this day i had the honor to dine with the prince de tengri duc de beaumont of the illustrious house of montmorency went to the concert spirituel in the royal garden where was an infinite number of gentlemen and ladies walking dined with the duchess d'anville at her house with her daughter and granddaughter dukes abbots etc 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 dined with the marshal de malabois with a great deal of company here also we were shown the marshal's ami seated at the table with all his great company i could say but little but i understood her as well as any one i had heard in french it appears to me that the marshal had chosen her rather for her wit and senses than personal charms dined with the marshal de mouchy with the duke and the duchess diane their daughter the marquis de lafayette and the viscount de malebois her sister another sister unmarried the prussian ambassador an italian ambassador and a great deal of other great company End quote. 
one offset there was to the complete enjoyment of dining out for groaning at the innumerable applications of officers to him for employment franklin complained that quote, i am afraid to accept an invitation to dine abroad being almost sure of meeting with some officer or officer's friend who as soon as i am put in good humor by a glass or two of champagne begins his attack upon me End quote. Until France recognized American independence, the negotiators could not be received at court or by the ministry, but once the Treaty of Amity and Commerce was signed, they became fully recognized diplomatic agents, and the hitherto closed official doors were thrown open to them. The whole court, at the first function Franklin attended, united to heap attention and distinction upon him, and from that time, as if to make up for the brief period of non-recognition, he was shown the utmost honor, being bidden to the greatest and most exclusive affairs, even to those given to royalty itself. He describes an opera given to a royal prince, at which he was present, where, quote, the house being richly finished with abundance of carving and gilding, well illuminated with wax tapers, and the company all superbly dressed, many of the men in cloth of tissue, and the ladies sparkling with diamonds, formed altogether the most splendid spectacle my eyes ever beheld, end quote in adam's diary is a reference to one ministerial dinner they went to given by vergennes there was a full table no ladies but the countess the count's brother the ambassador who lately signed the treaty with switzerland mr garnier the late secretary to the embassy in england and many others dukes and bishops and counts etc end of chapter twelve part two Chapter 12, Part 3 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 12, Social Life, Part 3. All these courtesies involved recognition, and Franklin seemed to have been, when able, fairly regardful of his social duties. For only a few weeks of his many years in Paris does he seem to have kept a diary, but that little reveals him as doing conscientiously the required courtesies. One afternoon's doings will suffice. Quote, we went to Paris to visit Princess Dashkaw, not at home. Visit Prince and Princess Masserano. Visit Duke de Rochefoucauld and Madame la Duchesse Longueville. Visit Misters Dana and Searle, not at home leave invitations to dine with me on sunday visit comte d'estaing not at home mr turgot not at home End quote. in one respect he refused to go through the conventional forms although the recognition of the united states gave franklin full diplomatic status with the french court his fellow ambassadors whose governments had not yet acknowledged the new country necessarily could not accept him as one of their corps by good luck the american minister heard that they had come to the decision not to quote, return the visits i should make them as they supposed when i was first received here as minister plenipotentiary and disappointed their project by visiting none of them in my private opinion the first civility is due from the old resident to the stranger and newcomer my opinion indeed is good for nothing against custom which i should have obeyed but for the circumstances that rendered it more prudent to avoid disputes and affronts though at the hazard of being thought rude or singular End quote. out of this anomalous situation came an incident ridiculous enough which caused the envoy not a little amusement and which he narrated as follows quote, the count de nord who is son of the empress of russia arriving at paris ordered it seems cards of visit to be sent to all the foreign ministers one of them on which was written le comte de nord et le prince baryatinsky was brought to me it was on monday evening last being at court the next day i inquired of an old minister my friend what was the etiquette and whether the count received visits the answer was non on s'y fait écrire voilà tout this is done by passing the door and ordering your name to be written on the porter's book. 
accordingly on wednesday i passed the house of prince baryatinsky ambassador of russia where the count lodged and left my name on the list of each i thought no more of the matter but this day may the twenty fourth comes the servant who had brought the card in great affliction saying he was like to be ruined by his mistake in bringing the card here and wishing to obtain from me some paper of i know not what kind for i did not see him in the afternoon came my friend m leroy who is also the friend of the prince's telling me how much he the prince was concerned at the accident that both himself and the count had great personal regard for me and my character but that our independence not yet being acknowledged by the court of russia it was impossible for him to permit himself to make me a visit as minister i told m leroy it was not my custom to seek such honours though i was very sensible of them when conferred upon me that i should not have voluntarily intruded a visit and that in this case i had only done what i was informed the etiquette required of me but if it would be attended with any inconvenience to prince baryatinsky whom i much esteemed and respected i thought the remedy was easy he had only to erase my name out of his book of visits received and i would burn their card the offer was accepted and the nameless danger thus avoided at the next attendance at court franklin noted that the quote, prince was particularly civil to me apologized for what passed relating to the visit expressed himself extremely sensible of my friendship in covering the affair which might have occasioned him very disagreeable consequences End quote. a diplomatic entanglement of much the same character though of very different conclusion occurred when the emperor joseph of austria came to paris in seventeen seventy seven he earnestly desired to make franklin's acquaintance but without giving it any political significance the minister of the grand duke of tuscany accordingly wrote the famous american quote, la belle nicole prit monsieur franklin de lui faire l'honneur de venir déjeuner chez lui mercredi matin le vingt huit de ce mois à neuf heures du matin il lui donnera une bonne tasse de chocolat verbally he informed franklin that the intention was to give the emperor an opportunity of an interview with him but owing to an accident this meeting did not take place eventually they were brought together and jefferson relates something concerning one of their encounters Quote, when dr franklin went to france on his revolutionary mission his eminence as a philosopher his venerable appearance and the cause on which he was sent rendered him extremely popular for all ranks and conditions of men there entered warmly into the american interest he was therefore feasted and invited to all the court parties at this he sometimes met the old duchess of bourbon who being a chess player of about his force they very generally played together happening once to put her king into prize the doctor took it ah says she we do not take kings so we do in america said the doctor at one of these parties the emperor joseph the second then at paris incognito under the title of count falkenstein was overlooking the game in silence while the company was engaged in animated conversations on the american question how happens it monsieur le comte said the duchess that while we all feel so much interest in the cause of the americans you say nothing for them i am a king by trade said he with pardonable pride the self-made man speaking of his father's having quote, among his instructions to me when a boy frequently repeated the proverb of solomon seest thou a man diligent in his calling he shall stand before kings he shall not stand before mean men remarked that quote, i did not think that i should ever literally stand before kings which however has since happened for i have stood before five and even had the honour of sitting down with one the king of denmark to dinner End quote. greatly in demand as the minister was for formal entertaining there was as well a v on team which has been more or less referred to already and which his recurrent attacks of the gout tended to foster 
of this life he has left a pleasant picture in his dialogue with the gout in which the disease accuses him of the following conduct Quote, the gout let us examine your course of life while the mornings are long and you have leisure to go abroad what do you do why instead of gaining an appetite for breakfast by salutary exercise you amuse yourself with books pamphlets or newspapers which commonly are not worth the reading yet you eat an inordinate breakfast four dishes of tea with cream and one or two buttered toasts with slices of hung beef which i fancy are not things the most easily digested immediately afterward you sit down to write at your desk or converse with persons who apply to you on business thus the time passes till one without any kind of bodily exercise but all this i could pardon in regard as you say to your sedentary condition but what is your practice after dinner walking in the beautiful gardens of those friends with whom you have dined would be the choice of men of sense yours is to be fixed down to chess where you are found engaged for two or three hours this is your perpetual recreation which is the least eligible of any for a sedentary man because instead of accelerating the motion of the fluids the rigid attention it requires helps to retard the circulation and obstruct internal secretions wrapped in the speculations of this wretched game you destroy your constitution what can be expected from such a course of living but a body replete with stagnant humours ready to fall a prey to all kinds of dangerous maladies if i the gout did not occasionally bring you relief by agitating these humours and so purifying or dissipating them if it was in some nook or alley in paris deprived of walks that you played a while at chess after dinner this might be excusable but the same taste prevails with you in passe artuel montmartre or senoy places where there are the finest gardens and walks a pure air beautiful women and most agreeable and instructive conversation all which you might enjoy by frequenting the walks but these are rejected for this abominable game of chess fie then mr franklin but amidst my instructions i had almost forgot to administer my wholesome corrections so take that twinge and that franklin oh ah oh ah as much instructions as you please madam gout and as many reproaches but pray madam a truce with your corrections the gout do you remember how often you have promised yourself the following morning a walk in the grove of boulogne in the garden de la muette or in your own garden and have violated your promise alleging at one time it was too cold at another too warm too windy too moist or what else you pleased when in truth it was too nothing but your insuperable love of ease franklin that i confess may have happened occasionally probably ten times in a year the gout your confession is far short of the truth the gross amount is one hundred and ninety-nine times franklin is it possible the gout so possible that it is fact you may rely on the accuracy of my statement you know mr brillon's gardens and what fine walks they contain you know the handsome flight of an hundred steps which lead from the terrace above to the lawn below you have been in the practice of visiting this amiable family twice a week after dinner and as it is a maxim of your own that a man may take as much exercise in walking a mile up and down stairs as in ten on level ground what an opportunity was here for you to have had exercise in both those ways did you embrace it and how often franklin i cannot immediately answer that question the gout well i will do it for you not once franklin not once the gout even so during the summer you went there at six o'clock you found the charming lady with her lovely children and friends eager to walk with you and entertain you with their agreeable conversation and what has been your choice why to sit on the terrace satisfying yourself with the fine prospect and passing your eye over the beauties of the garden below without taking one step to descend and walk about in them on the contrary you call for tea and the chessboard 
and lo you are occupied in your seat till nine o'clock and that besides two hours play after dinner and then instead of walking home which would have bestirred you a little you step into your carriage how absurd to suppose that all this carelessness can be reconcilable with health without my interposition franklin i am convinced now of the justness of poor richard's remark that our debts and our sins are always greater than we think they are End quote it was in paris or rather in the suburb of passe that for the first time franklin was situated so as to entertain john adams who lived for a time with him describes the place Quote, i determined to put my country to no further expense on my account but to take my lodgings under the same roof with dr franklin and to use no other equipage than his if i could avoid it this house was called the basse cour de monsieur le Ray de Chamont which was to be sure not a title of great dignity for the mansion of ambassadors though they were no more than american ambassadors nevertheless it had been nothing less than the famous hotel de valentinois with a motto on the door si sta bene non si muove from an englishman who came to the minister with a letter of introduction it is further learned that quote, his house was delightfully situated and seems very spacious and he seemed to have a great number of domestics we sent up the letter and were then shown up into his bedchamber where he sat in his nightgown his feet wrapped up in flannels and resting on a pillow he having for three or four days been much afflicted with the gout and the gravel franklin himself in answer to a question from a correspondent said you wish to know how i live it is in a fine house situated in a neat village on high ground half a mile from paris with a large garden to walk in i have abundance of acquaintance dine abroad six days in seven sundays i reserve to dine at home with such americans as pass this way and i then have my grandson ben with some other american children from the school End quote. in miss adams journal are brief accounts of two of these dinners Today we have dined with dr franklin she wrote of one there was a large company our family the marquis de lafayette and lady lord mount morris an irish volunteer dr jeffreys mr paul jones we had a sumptuous dinner of the second she said quote, dined today at dr franklin's the whole company were americans except an old man monsieur brillant who is a friend of the doctor and who came as he said a demander un dîner à pere franklin end quote. a description of yet a third of these dinners has been preserved by jefferson quote, the doctor had a party to dine with him one day at passe of whom one half were americans the other half french and among the last was the abbe reynal at the dinner he got on his favorite theory of the degeneracy of animals and even of man in america and urged it with his usual eloquence the doctor at length noticing the accidental stature and position of his guests at table come says he monsieur l'abbe let us try this question by the fact before us we are here one half americans and one half french and it happens that the americans have placed themselves on one side of the table and our french friends are on the other let both parties rise and we will see on which side nature has degenerated it happened that his american guests were carmichael harmer humphreys and others of the finest stature and form while those on the other side were remarkably diminutive and the abbe himself particularly was a mere shrimp he parried the appeal however by a complimentary admission of exceptions among which the doctor himself was a conspicuous one End quote. this open hospitality excited some criticism in america and franklin was warned that quote, our too liberal entertainment of our countrymen here has been reported at home by our guests and has given offence they must be contented for the future as i am he therefore said with plain beef and pudding the readers of the connecticut newspapers ought not to be troubled with any more accounts of our extravagance 
for my own part if i could sit down to dinner on a piece of their excellent salt pork and pumpkin i would not give a farthing for all the luxuries of paris End quote. apparently the decision was to his physical if not to his jovial advantage for john adams mentions that quote, franklin has broke up the practice of inviting everybody to dine with him on sunday at passe and he is getting better the gout left him weak but he begins to sit at table end quote. an amusing contrast to one of the great dinners that franklin and adams attended is supplied by adams who records that he quote, came home and supped with dr franklin on cheese and beer end quote. franklin's rules of conduct in society were well fitted to make him popular the wit of conversation he remarked consists more in finding it and others than showing a great deal yourself he who goes out of your company pleased with his own facetiousness and ingenuity will the sooner come into it again most men had rather please than admire you and seek less to be instructed and diverted than approved and applauded and it is certainly the most delicate sort of pleasure to please another the great secret of succeeding in conversation he said on another occasion is to admire little to hear much always to distrust our own reason and sometimes that of our friends never to pretend to wit but to make that of others appear as much as possibly we can to hearken to what is said and to answer to that purpose End quote. in one of his bagatelles the handsome and the deformed leg he described the two sorts of people in the world who with equal degrees of health and wealth become the one happy and the other miserable and the need society has for protecting itself from the latter class quote, an old philosophical friend of mine was grown from experience he declared very cautious in this particular and carefully avoided any intimacy with such people he had like other philosophers a thermometer to show him the heat of the weather and a barometer to mark when it was likely to prove good or bad but there being no instrument invented to discover at first sight this unpleasing disposition in a person he for that purpose made use of his legs one of which was remarkably handsome the other by some accident crooked and deformed if a stranger at the first interview regarded his ugly leg more than his handsome one he doubted him if he spoke of it and took no notice of the handsome leg that was sufficient to determine my philosopher to have no further acquaintance with him everybody has not this two-legged instrument but every one with a little attention may observe signs of that carping fault-finding disposition and take the same resolution of avoiding the acquaintance of those infected with it End quote. it was one of the rules which above all others made dr franklin the most amiable of men in society jefferson related never to contradict anybody if he was urged to announce an opinion he did it rather by asking questions as if for information or by suggesting doubts end quote. he was friendly and agreeable in conversation miss logan states which he suited to his company appearing to wish to benefit his hearers i could readily believe that he heard nothing of consequence himself but what he turned to the account he desired and in his turn profited by the conversation of others end quote it is little wonder that an eye-witness reports that quote, when he left passe it seemed as if the village had lost its patriarch end quote. nor was the break felt on one side alone and franklin wrote from america that he quote, could not forget paris and the nine years happiness i enjoyed there in the sweet society of a people whose conversation is instructive whose manners are highly pleasing and who above all the nations of the world have in the greatest perfection the art of making themselves beloved by strangers and now even in my sleep i find that the scenes of all my pleasant dreams are laid in that city or in its neighborhood End quote. manessa cutler who called upon franklin in his philadelphia home in seventeen eighty seven draws a pleasant picture of his last years dr franklin lives in market street he states between second and third streets but his house stands up a courtyard at some distance from the street we found him in his garden sitting upon a grass plat under a very large mulberry with several other gentlemen and two or three ladies there was no curiosity in philadelphia which i felt so anxious to see as this great man who has been the wonder of europe as well as the glory of america 
but a man who stood first in the literary world and had spent so many years in the courts of kings particularly in the refined court of france i conceived would not be a very easy access and must certainly have much of the air of grandeur and majesty about him common folks must expect only to gaze at him at a distance and answer such questions as he might please to ask in short when i entered his house i felt as if i was going to be introduced to the presence of a european monarch but how were my ideas changed when i saw a short fat trenched old man in a plain quaker dress bald pate and short white locks sitting without his hat under the tree and as mr jerry introduced me rose from his chair took me by the hand expressed his joy to see me welcomed me to the city and begged me to seat myself close to him his voice was low but his countenance open frank and pleasing he instantly reminded me of the old captain cummings for he is nearly of his pitch and no more of the air of superiority about him i delivered him my letters after he had read them he took me again by the hand and with the usual compliments introduced me to the other gentlemen of the company who were most of them members of the convention here we entered into a free conversation and spent our time most agreeably until it was dark the tea-table was spread under the tree and mrs bosch a very gross and rather homely lady who is the only daughter of the doctor and lives with him served it out to the company she had three of her children about her over whom she seemed to have no kind of command but who appeared to be excessively fond of their grandpapa franklin himself has left an equally pleasant description of this closing period of his life quote, i have found my family here in health good circumstances and well respected by their fellow citizens the companions of my youth are indeed almost all departed but i find an agreeable society among their children and grandchildren i have public business enough to preserve me from ennui and private amusement besides in conversation books my garden and cribbage considering our well-furnished plentiful market as the best of gardens i am turning mine in the midst of which my house stands into grass plots and gravel walks with trees and flowering shrubs cards we sometimes play here in long winter evenings but it is as in france they play at chess not for money but for honour or the pleasure of beating one another this will not be quite a novelty to you as you may remember we played together in that manner during the winter at passe i have indeed now and then a little compunction in reflecting that i spend time so idly but another reflection comes to relieve me whispering you know that the soul is immortal why then should you be such a niggard of a little time when you have a whole eternity before you so being easily convinced and like other reasonable creatures satisfied with a small reason when it is in favour of doing what i have a mind to i shuffle the cards again and begin another game End quote. to a friend he wrote we loved and still love one another we are grown grey together and yet it is too early to part let us sit till the evening of life is spent the last hours are always the most joyous when we can stay no longer it is time enough then to bid each other good night separate and go quietly to bed this ends the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford read for you by michelle fry in baton rouge louisiana thanks for listening and i hope you've enjoyed it